Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, colleagues, and good afternoon to anybody watching this uh, live web stream of the public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission. Uh, for those on the recording, this is the 14th of December, and it's shortly after 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, as a consequence of the RMT industrial action, we're having to do this as a virtual meeting, I'm afraid, rather than the planned physical meeting. Um, the technology, as you know, now works very much better, but inevitably a lot of people are dialing in from home and we have found we get occasional issues of, of freezing. So there's nothing we can do about that. Um, if it does happen, we'll find a workaround at the time, but I hope that uh, everything will work uh, positively during the, uh, the meeting. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have no apologies from my colleagues. I believe we are a full house here. Um, if I could uh, mention a few people who are joining us today, uh, as regular listeners will know, uh, we do always have a representative from our um, uh, quality networks. Uh, today, we're pleased to welcome Paul Kirby, who's the uh, quality representative this month. Um, and a couple of uh, names I should mention, I will return to this at the end of the meeting, uh, but this is Sally Cheshire's last board meeting. Um, I think we announced previously, but for the avoidance of doubt, Sally was appointed as the chair of NHS resolution a few months ago. Uh, and uh, that is a two to three day a week commitment. So we've agreed that sadly for us, we'll release Sally earlier from the board and she stands out at the end of this year. Uh, and then also, pardon me, uh, Rebecca Lloyd-Jones um, has been a stalwart of the organisation, uh, I've believe uh, you know we'll, we'll come back to that uh, later on as well but uh, she is retiring from CQC and so this will be the last meeting that she will attend. It's probably also worth mentioning that uh, last time we had a board meeting uh, I believe uh, Jora uh, was still on the board as a non-executive director. His term expired um, but he's very kindly agreed to uh, accept appointment as an associate, not executive director. So uh, he's still joining us uh, today. So uh, he's able to organize that. Uh, can I just confirm that there are no new conflicts of interest? There don't seem to be any. Uh, we have no additional urgent business that's been notified to us. So um, we'll stick with the agenda. It is quite a crowded agenda. And there are a number of things on it that are uh, put down as to note, but in practice, uh, we would expect that uh, the board will be uh, in agreement uh, with, or if not commenting on the proposals put forward to us. So these are things that aren't necessarily required by regulations to be approved, but I think in substance, uh, we do need to agree what has been put forward. Um, <clears throat> it was suggested it might be helpful just to give a very brief update on uh, board appointments, but in fact, there isn't much I can say. Um, I've already uh, referenced the fact that uh, Jora has um, stood down, um, albeit back in a different guise, that Sally goes at the end of this uh, month, uh, and Mark Saxon's term uh, will come to an end at the end of February, so that we have been doing a recruitment exercise. Um, one of those is to replace Robert Francis as the chair of Health Watch England. I say we, so I make it clear this is all run by the Department of Health and Social Care on behalf of ministers. So uh, seeking a replacement for Robert Francis as chair of HWE uh, and his role is uh, ex officio, a member of this board, and then also to uh, replace others who are leaving. Um, when we set off on that exercise, uh, Sally hadn't been appointed to NHS resolution, so we weren't looking for an audit committee chair at, at the stage. So basically, an exercise is being run. We've completed interviews for the HWE chair and two other NEDs. Uh, that is in process. Uh, I'm not able to give any more information. The department obviously will put up submissions to ministers in a normal way. And then we have agreed um, a job description for a replacement for Sally as the ARAC chair. Um, and that is likely to go live. I doubt it will happen now before Christmas, but uh, the, certainly the bulk of the advertisement period will be in the new year. Uh, and uh, we hope to make an appointment sometime in the first half of new year. Uh, that will leave us, um, uh, as Sally stands down, with a, a temporary position to fill as chair of the audit committee. Uh, so we have agreed that we will have a joint committee, uh, um, joint chair, sorry, of the committee, 
Uh, one is uh, Mark Saxton, who is already a member of the committee and the longest standing member of our board. Uh, and the other, uh, Jeremy Bose, who's the, uh, an independent member, but very experienced uh, audit committee member. And uh, he will take over as the, the joint chair. So between the two of them, they will oversee the effective running of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee until Sally's replacement is in place. So that's all I'm able to say at the present time. But uh, we thought it might be helpful to update those of you on this call and also anybody listening. So I think that's by way of the introductions uh, and uh, welcomes. So let's get straight on with the main agenda. Uh, the first is uh, we're going to consider the Pulse survey. Uh, this is the survey that was carried out of our staff a couple of months ago now. I'm going to ask Kate Taroni, uh, Kate, if you could um, introduce this item and then introduce your colleagues. As usual, uh, we have read the papers, uh, but I'm sure there are points you'd want to highlight before we go into discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, and, and good afternoon all. Um, so uh, you would have seen our Pulse survey results. Uh, this Pulse survey occurred during September and October of this year. Um, I think it would be fair to say it makes for quite tough reading for us um, in the leadership roles at, at CQC. Our colleagues have very clearly given us some strong messages about how they feel uh, we deliver change around here, how they feel about working in the organisation, how they feel about how we focus on well-being of, of staff. Um, I think it's really important that we um, we don't label this as a, just just a reaction to significant management change that a large number of our colleagues have gone through. I think uh, there are wider messages in there for us as well. Um, it's worth flagging that engagement continues to be really high. So staff continue to engage with us to tell us what they think we need to be doing better as an organisation. So we've got 79% engagement scores, which I know for many other organisations, that's a that's a thing to um, aspire to. There is also some good news in there around how staff feel empowered to do their job, to make decisions, uh, to deliver their role effectively. So, so there's good engagement scores, some good messages around our colleagues feeling empowered to do their role. However, there are some very strong messages about how they feel at the moment in the organisation, I think particularly around um, change. So, so we as a, an exec team were really keen that we didn't leap into action, but that we, um, we take a different approach to how we respond to this uh, people survey and really use the expertise of our, our, our colleagues to help shape what are the you know top five actions we might need to take going forward for example so um jackie jackson is our interim people director who's joining um this session today as is paul bannum who uh, is our head of um organizational development who's helped with the the pulse survey so i'm just going to ask jackie and then paul to talk about the action and the next steps and then we'll hand back to you chair for, for comments yeah thanks kate i'm actually going to ask paul to lead off on this conversation um, because he's been very close to the activity and then I can contribute as well as the conversation progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Kate. Um, so uh, you'll note from the paper that uh, our plan is to put in place a Pulse Survey advisory group. Um, and just by way of an update on that, we have um, recruited all 30 members to the Pulse Survey Advisory Group. We actually had over 100 applications to take part in the group, which I think is quite a positive sign that people are wanting to engage with this conversation. Um, to give you an idea of the makeup of the group, it will be 30 colleagues um, drawn from all the key areas of the business uh, and a cross-section of grades within that group. There will also be representation from our staff equality networks and from our trade unions. Um, give you a sense of what the group will be doing and the timeline. In in January, we'll be supporting members of the group to have conversations within their own local area of the organisation to review the uh, survey results for that area of, of CQC. Um, and the aim will be that by the end of January, directorates will have identified three priority areas around which they can form uh, an action plan. Um, and the, the group will also come together in February to identify five areas of priority uh, for a, a corporate level. Um, and the aim is the uh, action plans for directorates will be in place in February. Um, the action plan at corporate level will go to executive team in February and will be in place by March. Um, and then we'll be further supporting colleagues to work with uh, leaders and uh, areas of the business that are particularly uh, in, uh, 
implicated in, in, in the improvement actions um, to deliver those uh, action plans. We're also talking with our survey provider about how we can shape our future survey program in order to track and monitor those improvements across the year leading up to our planned main survey at the end of 2023. Happy to take any comments or questions, Chair. You are mute. Should I speak in? Yeah. Um, so I, I just 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 um, just to reinforce some of the things that Kay said. I think there was a very big theme around uh, listening in, in the survey uh, and also having. Having gone through a lot of the free text comments, I think there was there was definitely a theme uh, around a changing relationship between between the people working in an organisation and an organisation. I think as we come out of COVID, this sort of work life balance question is becoming much more blurred uh, and and much more much more nuanced than than perhaps it has has been in previous years. So this is why this this uh, it, this uh, advisory group is so important because it enables us to get into um, the quite sophisticated conversations that we need to have. I think. Um, I think there's a, there's a real risk for us as a senior team if we just do one or two headline things and think that's done. Uh, that would be the wrong answer, and that's why I think this this, this quite sophisticated uh, that's quite sophisticated point about the advisor group is important. Um, we are also doing a number of other things, a number of of specific things around continuing with the the big calls that we've had on on these in these virtual settings. But I think it's also clear to me that uh, we wanted we need to do more face to face activity as well. So there are programs of, of work that we're doing as individual directors. And I, I've got a, a program I'm kicking off as well to meet very small groups of people around the country. So there's a range of, of things which are, are broadly themed around the listening point. But I do think there's a, there's a lot of sophistication in this. Um, and, and, and on top of that, I think at this point that different directors and different teams are in, are in different places. And I think the, the, the variation in the, across the different the, across the different teams is also is also quite stark. Um, and, and I think there's, there's definitely a, uh, there's definitely some some positives around some of the things that uh, some of the teams that are further along the change journey uh, have experienced. Um, but that said, I think even those teams uh, have got some have got some things they're concerned about. So hence the, the approach to listening. So thanks. Ian. OK, well, thanks. Ian. Thanks for chipping in. I uh, was unable to unmute my microphone. Apologies for that. Uh, we do have a number of questions. Uh, Mark Chambers. Thank you. Well, I, I think you have a, a huge opportunity with 79% participation rate. I think that's the, you know, that's the most gratifying part of of, of this, and it and and it's um, a, a tremendous credit to everyone in the organisation that they have taken the time to to share their views. This truly reflects the results. Reflect. The, the the views of the organization and they are and you know they're so much more actionable as a result um i think the response is 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 right you're avoiding uh, a lot of the dangers from from uh results which are a disappointment of of trying to rationalize them away as a as a, as a, as a moment in time or jump to conclusions as to the root cause you know or to sort of Declare instant victory and and say, well, yes, but what we've done since has 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 completely changed the the game. I I, I think it's a it's a measured and um, uh, entirely appropriate response to take time to listen and properly understand the results. I'm glad you mentioned the free text comments, Ian, because those are those are always um, uh, take you to a, a, an understanding that the raw scores can't can't do. Um, I you know I, I, I think it's key that the action plan uh, uh, um, really does focus on the small number of key actions that the small number of of, of key insights that are going to then drive actions for improvement. I think that, that you know the danger is with with a lot of um, in input that you end up with a with a laundry list of things to do, and I think that would be a mistake. I think the you know the answer here is to focus on the four or five things that are really going to move move the needle on this. But I, look, I commend the team. I think this is 
I think the response to this has been uh, uh, has been very appropriate, and it feels very different to um, the the you know the, uh, and 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 a a, a quality response uh, to uh, you know compared to um, uh, you know I, I, I think I would respectfully say some of the uh, approaches that that in, in in the past, not that those were wrong, but I think you know this is um, uh, there's a quality of insight here, and there's an, uh, and there's a commitment to understand and listen actively, which I think will land very well. Thank you, Mark. Sally. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with Mark. And I just wanted to go back to the nuance that Ian Trenholm talked about before. So we have talked about having a workforce who feel they are trusted, empowered and confident. Mm. And I think within those three values, um, there is quite a lot to be positive about. People clearly feel they have autonomy in their jobs. They have flexibility to do that. They are empowered to do what's a very serious role inspecting health and social care providers there are some things around them um, perhaps not feeling in control of their own situation which is somewhat inevitable in a time of change but that they don't feel they've got the power to um, either effect change or um, in some cases potentially control their workload um, the bit that I think we can help them with as they go through this process of change, because clearly some people, for example, in Data and Insights, have come out of the other side of a difficult process, is to concentrate on how our employees feel valued, because I think that was one of the things that came out. So I wondered if there's anything more to say on that, or just that um, as part of the listening exercise, you will ask people how we can do more to make them feel valued. Thanks. Want to take all the comments at once, Ian, or do you want us to respond? Uh, to no, side? let's take. Uh, there are. There's only one more, so I'll answer that one now, and then we'll take the next one. Okay. Jackie or Paul, do you want to come in on, on what we currently do around reward? But also, I know we've got ambitions to do to to do a lot more. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come in on that. So, um, we are looking at our our whole reward. We, you know, we're all limited in terms of of, of the pay award and, and and where we sit with that. But certainly into next year, we'll be looking at the art of the possible with the pay flexibility case. So that is plotted in to start in January to, um, you know, kick off the work that we had to pause in order to make the, the pay award at the end of the year. Also looking at um, how we can do peer to peer recognition and reward and, and, and be able to think about, you know, out of the box, what is out there in the marketplace, what is really innovative, um, what's new um, and what's up and coming. And I think we'll probably have been a bit slow to do that. So um, certainly Paul and I have been having discussions around um, looking to benchmark with other organisations um, where it's not all around the, the, the monetary value. Um, so there, there is work in train that happy to come back and report on um, as, as we get more information regarding that, because absolutely that is something that we need to listen to and within our gift be able to come to the advisory group and wider with some proposals and some suggestions. OK, thanks, Jackie. Um, number of other uh, comments, so let's keep going. Stephen Marston. Thank you, Ian, and, and thank you very much for the paper. Like like others, I'm uh, happy to endorse the the approach proposed. Particularly welcome the setting up of the focus group. I, I, I do think that's a, an important initiative and an important signal to the organisation, because one of the aspects to this seems to me the need to sort of keep thinking hard about how effective communication is handled throughout the organization um, and this is a I, I guess maybe a source of a bit of frustration because i know the leadership team has worked incredibly hard to communicate actively regularly and well particularly about the transformation program and the whole strategy 
but it is also one of the areas of of biggest fall in the results people still saying that they don't feel particularly well informed so there's a there's a mismatch that you see in many organizations between a really a, a genuine attempt to communicate but with large numbers of staff still feeling yeah but i still don't feel fully informed or engaged or part of developing this whole story so I was, I, i'm just kind of interested in in any any thinking about what is this telling us about future approaches to communication a number of colleagues have already noted well actually it's really important to to listen well to show that we're listening carefully because that's part of a genuine two-way communication too and i'm just sort of putting a bit of emphasis on trying to understand well where where might we go in terms of more effective communication of the whole change program that's going on in the organization thank you if I could kick off, and I think Ian and Chris want to come on, on this same item as well, if that that's OK. Um, so, Stephen, I think um, when I look back about how we've communicated the changes to date, I think there has been quite a strong emphasis on um, us uh, giving a message into the organisation. So we've made a commitment uh, to uh, endeavour to always brief senior, you know, to kind of cascade down messages so that managers can support their teams when they when they hear that news. So the consequence of that is there have been a number of kind of you know maybe monthly broadcasts where Ian or I or other colleagues will uh, will jump on a call with often large numbers of people and deliver the message. And the benefit of that is that everyone hears the same, you know, broadly the same message at the same time and we know what's being delivered. I think on the flip side, it doesn't enable those kind of small groups to come together and ask questions. And so I, I, and, and Chris will come in now. We are we are currently actively looking at how we take a different approach going forward, which is much more around empowering. And, and Tyson's been doing it in his networks where there is more ownership and, and those messages coming out more from within you know the operations group within the network directors rather than kind of all, all colleague broadcasts that we've done today i think there was I still feel um, I still support our rationale as to how we've done it um, at, at the start of the transformation because it's really important that people heard the same kind of messages. Um, but I, but we need to adapt our, our style um, going forward. Chris, did you just want to come in on on that point? Yeah, I just just two things really. Um, one is a general point about making sure that as we as we uh, continue the communication engagement internally and in fact externally we're making a strong link back to what is changing and the and the benefit that goes back to our purpose so it talks go so we're linking the, the changes um um the, the 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 implications of the changes and how that delivers on the strategy and back to our purpose and then as kate said i think sometimes we've um we've wanted to make sure everybody gets the same message at the same time I think that there's, there's logic to that, but I think equally it's important that people who manage people feel able to and responsible for the engagement with their team so they can make it come to life for the people that they they look after. And I think often we've we've treated everybody as a as a as an important uh, uh, colleague, and we've and we've uh, we've engaged everybody at the same time. I think that the part of the, the change that we're trying to make is how do we equip people who manage people so that they understand what we're trying to do as a as a as a group, and that they feel able to have conversations with their team so they can bring to life the changes for their team. I think part of this is about how we make it. You know, come to life if you work in our national call centre or if you work in our registration team or if you work in finance because it will it'll be it'll mean different things to different people alongside obviously our our uh, inspection uh, 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 and reg other regulation colleagues so I think part of the challenge is um, making sure that we can link, link back to purpose and strategy and making sure that managers or people that manage people are confident in the conversations that they need to have with their team. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Chris, Ian, do you want to add to that before I go to other same, questions? Yeah, same, 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 same sort of, same sort of answers. I think, I think we will, we will continue to need to make 
if you like, mass broadcast announcements on some things in order to make sure that people, that everyone knows the same thing at the same time. But it's, it's also worth, worth remembering that just under half of our workforce are inspectors and the other half of our workforce do other things, as Chris was describing. So sometimes what we're, what some of these, uh, some of the mass communications are talking about are only of interest to one particular community of people. Excuse uh, me. We... Excuse me. So uh, thanks. Uh, 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 and and, and um, so, some of the times when we're making mass communications, we are um, we're, we're only talking to we're, we're, we're talking to something which is only by definition going to be of major interest to one community of, of people or, or another. I think there's also something about about this is te this takes a long time. I think when we started out with this uh, out with this with the transformation program, we talked about transforming the whole organisation, and I think. There's a slight glibness sometimes when people talk about transformation, whereas actually when I talk to other people outside the organization around what we are engaged in, they are sort of utterly, uh, utterly incredulous about the amount of change that we are undertaking. We're changing our methodology, our, our technology stack. We're, we're moving people massively around between um, between teams and keeping everybody up to speed on all of that and being able to reflect back everybody's voices as we are changing the entire organization uh, over an extended period of time is, is a challenge and, and you know I, I think we we need to keep looking look, looking hard at how we can how we can improve what we do um, and of course overlaying all of that with the fact that um, that, that we haven't got as much face-to-face uh, -face contact as, as as would be ideal, and I think that would that would be helpful. So again, I'm I'm hoping that in terms of going forward, we we can we, we can build on some of the messages that this survey this this survey is giving us because I think there's a lot of important work here. But I do think we also need to think about how this plots into the length of time it's, it it will inevitably take to transform. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, last couple of questions, Mark Saxton. Thank you, Chairman, and Paul and Jackie, thanks for bringing this report to us and some of the top line information that uh, that you've given us for, for this meeting. Um, I guess uh, there are two areas that really uh, struck me in the data that you provided. One was the big fall off in health and well-being. Um, which was a, a, a major reduction. Um, versus our last survey. Um, and, you know, I know that I know that it, it's um, been a positive response in some areas, but it's a very significant fall off. And uh, I just wonder whether you, you could comment on that. Um, the second area that um, I'd like to just look, you know, get your comments on is uh, recommended as a place to work and that's very interesting isn't it is it not in that you know on um, page to lean forward to read 29 of uh, of our pack we've seemed to have had a dramatic shift in this between this survey and the last survey survey from strongly agree and agree as recommending CQC as a good place to work to shifting to strongly disagree and disagree. I just you know, wonder if you could give some comment on that. And finally, I think the survey advisory group is great. I think it's terrific that it's you, you've uh, been able to get a good representation across the business for that. I just wonder, Paul, whether uh, and, and I'm sure you're not giving too much of a steer because the uh, the advantage of the survey group is that people come to you with what they think needs to be done. But uh, I wonder whether there's going to be any sort of suggestion. Are, are there any other areas that people feel print in this survey group uh, that we should be asking about? Paul, do you want to... Uh, have a first go at that, and I see Tyson's got his hand up, so I might ask him to comment before we come back to Jora. But Paul, yeah, no, so thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, I think on the the um, uh, recommend CQC is a good place to work. We we did hit as quite a lot of organisations did during the pandemic. We we hit quite a high, and and it has plateaued uh, probably at a more um, stable level, which is probably more realistic in terms of our expectations. Um, uh, for a number of months, but uh, a number of surveys at this one, it has dropped, which I think is a reflection of some of the um, the scores in other items. So the sort of combined effect of, of, of the other messages that people are giving us. Um, 
I think you're right. I think we we do need to be cautious about directing the group. But um, I think where in the past perhaps we haven't made a strong enough connection is that there have been uh, quite a range of improvements put in place in the organisation that have launched from survey feedback. And what we potentially haven't done is closed the loop in making sure people understand that activity started as a consequence of their feedback. And I think we, I think people plan was on the um, on the agenda earlier on. And that's that's a good example. A lot of what we do uh, in the people directorate is is in response to what people tell us about the way they feel about the organisation. So I think when we for when we bring the, the group together, one of the things that we will be able to do is to um, have an open conversation about things that are already in train um, and 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 seek their feedback into how we can build on that. I think in terms of themes, I think there are some fairly clear demand signals from the organisation around communication, around change um, that I think will inevitably be part of the conversations going forward in that group. Okay, thank you, Paul. Tyson, do you uh, wish to add anything? If you could be brief, if you could, because we're running over that. Of course. Um, thank you. And I was just going to pick up on Mark's point about, about well-being, which I think he's very well made. I mean, our colleagues clearly found the, the, the extent of the transformation, the people transformation, the operations very stressful. I think it was partly because of the pace at which we were working. And I think also partly because they felt um, this links back to the not being listened to comment. They didn't feel empowered to or have, have any have, have any license in order to, to, to make change. I think there's a number of things we can do going forward, notwithstanding what the advisory group says one is we are doing the transition into our new teams more slowly so we can do that in a more managed way and we can do that in a way that is collaborating more more with our people we need to promote the the tools the the, the well-being tools um, that, are, that are out there already and we probably should have done more of that if we went along but also I think people had also had to deal with things that were going on in their private lives but also very busy workloads and increasingly particularly our inspection teams were managing more risk were managing more enforcement and I think all of that together was a com was a combination of factors so one area where I think we do need to do more is at the higher end of well-being and we're working on a project at the moment looking particularly at managing trauma where our colleagues um, encounter traumatic situations what do we do as an employer in order to give them the support they need and we're looking at a, a trauma management tool such as trim which we're piloting at the moment and i'm hoping we can roll out in the new year so i think there's a combination of things we, we need to do mark well, thanks so much tyson uh Jora, i'll make this last uh, comment if i could yeah well, well um, tyson and mark covered the, the point around mental well-being i think people have been through a lot over the last few years. Um, not only the COVID, but now we find ourselves in a cost of living situation. So I think all those external factors and then a massive change internal, it seems that, you know, although we don't see it, but maybe people are getting it, that change fatigue because their lives are changing constantly. Um, um, so, so, I, so I think Tyson made that point sort of really well. It was interesting to see the tech and data side of things um, really be quite positive. But then I was thinking, Technology and data, they live for change, and um, that's what their, their, their lives are all about. But also, I think they're also part of the change, um, so they're actually determining the change. And, and I think it would be interesting, Paul, as the 30 are sort of gathering information, it seemed that the, the feedback was very positive when people had clarity on their roles and they know what they're doing. But the, the less sort of, you know, it was when they're, they're not part of the change. So I think the com communication has been excellent um, so far. But how can we involve people more in the change rather than feeling it's something they don't have control over and it's something's happening over there and it's it's another thing that's happening to me that I have little control over. So it could be something worth looking into. Thank you. Well, I think that's probably more a comment than a question, unless there's anything the execs want to, to say. Uh, well, look, um, the, uh, let's uh, sort of wrap this uh, discussion up. I had a comments, but my colleagues have all made them. Um, I, I would just um, emphasize a couple of things myself. I mean, this clearly, you know, nobody would attend this as a great set of results, but I do think the organization, the culture, the, the, the executive leadership deserve credit. It would have been very easy um, to propose that we deferred the survey because it was done at the, the height of period of uncertainty, I suppose. But um, you know, there was no proposal to do that. Um, the, the results have been unedited, um, 
shared with uh, colleagues within the organization and in the public meeting. And I think there's something about the uh, openness with which that's done that speaks very well for the culture and the organization and the likelihood of being listened to. Um, that said, um, obviously, you know, there is quite a lot to be done. Just an example of openness, I would say, um, but also other points made. You know, I've had a couple of direct approaches from staff, you know, as the chair, could could something be done? Um, the most recent one, the, the very way the questions were phrased, showed that there was a misunderstanding of what was proposed. But, I mean, there's been no hesitation. Uh, I passed it on to Tyson, and he's going to, to meet to explain in more detail what's happening. So the, the, there is that degree of responsiveness. So I think management deserve credit for that. Um, I, I just from a personal perspective and experience, I, I emphasize as well the point Ian made that I think trying to do this in a virtual environment is incredibly difficult. Not many organizations have done such a relatively major transformation since we all had to turn to uh, much more home working and doing it virtually. So I'm sure there's lessons to be learned there for both us and other organizations. Uh, there's clearly more to, to look at. So I expect this would come back, what, probably in March. Kate, would that be right? Yeah, yeah, we'll come back in come back in springtime and, and provide an update. So we want the advisory group to get established, deliver a set of recommendations and for us to uh, have some of those in train so that we can give you kind of a, a concrete update on the actions we've taken as a result of that. OK, well, thanks very much. Uh, Paul, I don't thank you for your contribution. I'm not sure if you're staying. I know Jackie is. Um, we've now got the quarterly progress update on the people plan. I mean, we've probably covered some of the themes in that, um, but Kate and Jackie, um, if I go over to you, usual rules, we have read the papers, so pick up high spots and then we'll deal with any questions, thanks. Thank you, Kim. I'm gonna hand straight to Jackie on this one, over to you, Jackie. Oh, thank you. Um, so I've just um, pulled out some um, verbal updates that um, I think chair and board would be um, interested in. So if I can start off with um, diversity and inclusion, we welcomed a new diversity inclusion manager in November and she has quickly um, hit the ground with um, some really good conversations. Colleagues on this call, um, Mark Chambers, Scott and Paul, um, started good conversations with good insight into um, helping our thought process and shaping our plans as we go into next year. The, uh, the, the plans that we're, th that we're going to put together from January onwards are in conjunction with the RES and DES, DES plans that already exist, but actually by bringing them to life um, and how we integrate, how we approach inclusive and diversity into everything we do. I think at the minute it feels so it sits a little bit alongside our activity and it's about how working together we can bring that to be an integral part um, of, of activity across CQC. We currently um, have the Count Me In programme that was launched to, include, to increase uh, declarations of the protected characteristics. Um, and the executive grades have now closed, whilst the rates have yet to be verified. The target was 95%. And the um, rates range from 93.5 to 96. So, like I say, unverified, but that was a real great take up by executive colleagues in terms of um, completing the declarations. Um, TDI now have had the rollout of the Count Me In, and that will run for the next few weeks. And again, we'll be monitoring completion with a view to rolling this out throughout the rest of the directorates as we go into um, January stroke February next year. So I think that was some additional information regarding um, diversity. Um, line manager capability. Um, that continues to be uh, worked on and rolled out. There was a short session for ops colleagues um, in terms of in, in increasing capability in light of the transformation. That has had some really good feedback, so we'll be continuing to build on that. Um, and the inclusive leadership programme as well. 
that was launched last year, last month um, for colleagues E3 and Band D. There's two programmes, E3 and Band D, and then Grade B downwards. And this is recognising um, colleagues in our diverse um, co colleagues with diversity to encourage development, encourage opportunity, encourage succession planning. So we're already starting to think about stretch projects, to think about um, opportunities for colleagues who are going through that programme and how we can support and develop them throughout the programme and beyond. Um, and the last thing which we've already touched on is the peer-to-peer -peer support and how we're going to do some market testing on some of the um, apps, some of the technology that's available um, to see what would best suit our needs. So unless there's um, any other specific questions, I think that was all of what I want, the, the points I wanted to bring to um, the board today. OK, thanks, Jackie. I think there may be a few questions. Mark Saxon. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Jackie. I think uh, all the colleagues on this call now have always been very supportive of the People Plan. Um, and I'm pleased to see good progress uh, within the plan. But uh, could I just pick up on two points that I gleaned from this report? Firstly, the Working Well project. I think that's great, but can I really encourage you to look outside the organization and glean some best practice from other organizations? I think we really need to see how other organizations have responded to the post-pandemic world, you know, how we communicate, develop, recognize, behave inclusively with a distributed workforce. Uh, and I think that's worthy of, of, of some, intention, uh, some attention. And secondly, can I just say in terms of capability building, obviously the DNI team have done some really great work there and again, it's back to that transfer of best practice. And, you know, you can see that good work being come. The outcome of that is in their survey results. So let's build on that and transfer that learning across the whole organization. Yeah, thank you. I should just add one more point. There is um, an active project as well, which I've undertaken on reasonable adjustment, which will obviously thread in to um, the, area, the areas I've covered and will follow the same patterns we're taking for, you know, the diversity element as well um, and about how we make that an integral part of everything we do. Um, and we are linking in with external um, charities and external uh, best practice companies regarding uh, the support to colleagues requiring um, reasonable adjustments and, 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 and how we achieve those really excellent standards there. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I have a couple of other questions. Belinda. Uh, hi, Jackie. I was just confined on the part about reverse mentoring. I know that's something we talked about in the last people plan. I just wondered, has it dropped off the plan or is it just not mentioned in this particular report? I'm going to be totally honest, Belinda, having sort of just come into the role relatively soon, that is something I haven't um, had the hands to sort of like reach out to at the minute. Um, I can certainly take it away um, and have a look at it, but I, I am not in a position to respond to that on this call. Thank I you. Think, Let, yeah. if, I, if I have a if I have a go and then other, so so Belinda, you'll remember that some um, non no. some NEDs and some of the exec team were involved with this as well, um, and it was um, evaluated. We did it in partnership with the university. It was evaluated, and my um, my understanding was um, there were varying degrees of views about how successful it, it was. But I think one of the main messages was did it actually lead to different career opportunities for people? And I think there was a question mark over that. And and my understanding is this inclusive leadership program that we're setting up now takes those ingredients of what worked well with reverse mentoring, but is looking to um, 
have a much more of a concrete outcome for colleagues who are in that inclusive leadership in terms of um, opportunities to apply for jobs and stuff. So I, I think it's not saying uh, parking reverse mentoring. I think it's taking the learning from that uh, uh, into the, the inclusive leadership programme, which is about, um, you know, successes, seeing uh, increased diversity through the senior levels of the organisation as one of the you know success outcomes as well. Um, but let us let me just loop back with Jackie and and, uh, and or unless any other colleagues want to correct me, that's my that's my understanding of where that got oh, to. Thanks. Thank you. OK, thanks, Kate. I mean, it, it won't capture as a formal action, but if you just clarify that offline, that'd be great. Uh, Sally. Uh, thanks, Ian, and thank you for the update. I'm also supportive of the People Plan, and I think we're showing real progress. Just had a couple of um, questions on the specific bits in this paper. So the first one is that we um, we talk a lot about data and skills and capability. And I wonder if there's more room to talk about some of the softer issues, which relates back to my point before about our employees being valued. And just secondly, on leadership and change, we talk a lot about equipping our line managers with um, training or capability, which is definitely something I'd support. But we don't talk about our exec or senior people and how they're going to lead change, which I think also kind of relates back to the previous discussion around uh, the Pulse survey. Thanks. Any comments? Welcomed. Well, I, I always think the principle, Sally, that we are, if we're offering something out to our people, you know, we should, we would all want the, the benefit of, of learning from that as well. So I think that's probably something we want to take away and yeah. come back to you on. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Do you want to comment on that? Thank you, Ian. Um, if I can just pick up on one point, Sally, um, as, as you may, as you will have seen in the um, in, in some earlier papers, we, we're now recruiting to deputy director roles, um, which are of the E3, so the so the the third layer of executive grade. Um, that all of those colleagues will be going through an induction program and also some targeted um, some targeted learning as well. So we're starting instead of starting at the top and rolling down, we're sort of starting lower down and and rolling that type of intervention up. And the operations manager training intervention that Jackie talked about that's had such positive um, feedback we are going to we're going to be rolling that out to our e3 colleagues as well thanks and Ian, you want to add I, I was going to say broadly the same thing I think I think in terms of Sally's question I think the the coaching support and the and the work that we do as lead, as groups of leaders uh, has 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 uh, offered some dividends but I think the area that that or the group that of leaders who didn't have a particularly uh, strong leadership development offer was was the, the those first line leaders that Tyson was describing. So I think that's where the that's where the focus is right now. But um, I think the broader, if I click up a level, the broader the broader pro the broader problem that we have is we don't currently have an HR system that is capable of tracking tracking uh, skills. Uh, and capabilities right across the organization in the way that we would probably like which would give us i think a more insightful and consistent set of offers so i think there are a set of offers but they are tracked across the organization in, in a in a way which is okay but it's not it's not quite as uh, sophisticated as we'd like so that's one of the, the things for for downstream is how can we do that in a more in a more uh, consistent and thoughtful way thank you yeah. okay thanks yeah. um uh, any more, no, no more questions. So let's draw that to a, uh, uh, a halt, Jackie. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us. I think you've got broad agreement to the, uh, to, to the plan and approach, a lot of support for that. Um, we've already agreed in the previous session that we'd have a report back on the Pulse survey and what management are doing in March. And just stating the obvious, maybe it would be useful to just see whether or not there are modifications regarding to this plan in the light of what comes out of the, the work on that Pulse survey. Um, and, you know, we note here your point that um, our existing systems are not perfect in this area. So there's no, no immediate fix on there, but it's on the subject to funding agreement from the department, something we would like to get done, I guess, over the next uh, couple of years, probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jackie, thanks very much Thank indeed you. for that. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, bye bye. Bye bye. Um, so, Ian, uh, over to you and your team. Um, we've got a uh, report on regulatory and organisational matters from you. So it's to note, read the papers, highlight what you want, and then we'll take questions. 
Thanks, Ian. Uh, just, just, to, just to remind colleagues, this is a new format of report. Uh, we normally have a single report that covers the whole gamut of both regulatory and operational matters. We've split the report uh, into, into two halves now to, to probably better reflect the way the organisation is now operating with regulatory leadership as, as one component and operations as, as another component. Um, I'm going to ask Sean to talk in a, in a moment about what's going on uh, in, in the healthcare environment, but just, I don't want to make a couple of comments. One is since the last board, uh, we published our state of care report. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to the teams that, that, that helped put that together. That, that is our annual report to Parliament and it, and it reflects uh, the perspective that we have and it, it brings the voices of, of 3,000 people, 3,000 of our colleagues together to, to talk about what's going on in, in the health and social care system. Our core message this year was that the system is gridlocked um, and, that, and that people are stuck in the wrong place. And I, I'm really pleased that that, that that message really resonated, I think, with the people that worked in, in, in health and social care, as well as the wider public. And, and our, our report has been widely quoted and widely reported, and it continues to be cited extensively by journalists and by politicians. And we've also produced uh, a number of other reports uh, recently, including our, our annual mental health services report and report on services for people with a learning disability and autistic people. And again, I, I think whilst there are some points of detail in those reports, this, this whole issue of, 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 sh of workforce shortages comes up again as again, again and again as a recurring theme. We achieved a, a really important milestone in the submission of our draft methodology on integrated care systems and local authority assurance by submitting our methodology to the Secretary of State, and we await uh, feedback from, from the Secretary of State in due course. Um, and alongside that, we have been talk we've begun conversations with uh, Patricia Hewitt and her team uh, as part of her rapid review into integrated care. So I, I think it'd be fair to say that we are, we are in good shape in terms of, of uh, starting to go live with uh, integrated care system uh, assurance and local area, local authority assurance uh, in at the beginning of April. Um, just one final thing before I hand over to Sean, uh, it's just, just to make a point about strike action. I'm conscious that, that in all likelihood nurses will be on strike uh, tomorrow and again uh, on another day before Christmas and that, that and there's, there's a number of other strikes. I think what we've said uh, as a regulator is that we will, uh, we're in, in terms of reflecting that context, uh, we will only be carrying out inspection activity where we have concerns around serious harm. Um, and we'll be, we have asked providers to contact us proactively if they're worried about their, their abilities to, uh, to, 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 to offer safe care so that we can, we can talk to them about it beforehand. So that's all I wanted to say, uh, Ian, just for, in terms of, uh, in terms of highlights. I'm going to hand over to Sean now just to talk about the, some of the current issues in healthcare. Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And I'll just um, I'll focus really mainly on the urgent uh, and emergency care pathway as that um, as the gridlock issue we describe in the recent state of care report remains a significant concern uh, with difficulties in achieving discharge for patients with a social or domiciliary care need still impacting on hospital capacity uh, with knock on effects felt through the whole urgent and emergency care service resulting in delays with internal patient transfers, delays with admission and consequently delays with ambulance handovers at emergency departments. Uh, it's important to say, though, that we recognise uh, how NHS staff can continue to work exceptionally hard to provide safe and compassionate care in the face of this increased demand. I've seen this commitment and dedication myself on a number of recent visits to hospitals. And it's also important to say that we're working with others to ensure that we give the support we can uh, to the uh, implementation of the NHS Winter Plan. And we're also seeking to support innovative approaches in the service uh, by developing some new internal mechanisms that will help us identify, uh, spread and disseminate learning regarding safe and effective best practice more, more widely and more quickly. So I think that's, uh, that's all I was going to say. Ian. Thanks. So See, over to you, Ian. Uh, so uh, before we move on to uh, organisational uh, things. Uh, I have a couple of questions, so let, let colleagues go first. So, uh, any questions from any of my colleagues? 
I know a couple from from me, if I could. Uh, firstly, Sean, for you, um, uh, be helpful if you just say a couple of words about the um, acute maternity services review. And my understanding is we hope to have that work completed, uh, finally completed around about May. Is that correct? That's, that is my understanding. As you know, there's a big program where we are uh, inspecting all services that were haven't been inspected since April 21. Um, as part of that program, we are uh, listening to uh, listening to service users, to partners, to uh, all those involved, uh, and we'll be re producing uh, reports, hopefully, uh, with additional new insights into how maternity services can be uh, can be supported to improve. Um, but we hope that work will be finished, um, yes, in the spring of next year. OK, I mean, it's interesting just to highlight again, I suppose, doing it for your agreement. But uh, this is the first time we've done one of these sort of major themed reviews. I think by looking at post April 21 um, inspections, we are capturing about 75 percent of all maternity units, was, was my understanding. Um, but this is important in its own right. But I think also um, if we can demonstrate the benefits of this sort of thing and, and actually getting some change working with with others, then um, it'll be potentially a template for, for other ways of working. So sorry, again, I suppose I'm just asking for confirmation. I, I've got that right. I, I think Thank that's you. correct. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, and then uh, I see Sally, you've got your hand up. Let me, let me just I said there were a couple of things. One for you, Ian. Um, you did mention uh, we've submitted a letter to the Secretary of State on um, <clears throat> our, on our proposed approach with care systems. Uh, we didn't specifically mention funding. So um, I, I wonder if you just say a bit more about when we might expect a response from the Secretary of State and where on the cr critical path that is. In other words, when do we need it by so as not to hold things up? And then a couple of words on where we are on funding. My understanding at the moment, and Chris, I sure will be able to we'll be able to offer the very latest position. But my understanding is that we've had assurances from the department that we will receive uh, funding support for the work we're doing this year to prepare for the first of April. But we have not yet had confirmation of funding uh, for the operational service from the first of April. Um, and, and there are one or two other. Uh, points of detail around things like commencement orders, which which also need to be in place before we can formally go live on the first first of April. But from a CQC point of view, um, I think we think that uh, we will we'll be able to start work on the first of April. But we do need confirmation or, or formal confirmation of, of live funding um, for for next next financial year from the first of April. Well, uh, and of our approach, mm -hmm. uh, and Chris, of course of our approach. Yeah. Uh, that's that's correct. There was nothing nothing for me to add or in to just set out there, is right? Okay. So so just to be clear, I think um, on the last uh, public board meeting, we noted the fact that we there was uncertainty on funding, and we did say we would get to the stage where by December, if we hadn't got that sorted out, we would have to at this meeting give serious consideration to slowing down or deferring or even potentially stopping some of our work. I think what you said is we now have that commitment of funding, so we haven't got the cash yet, but. But, but it's reasonable to assume that, that we will get it and so we can proceed, albeit we still have to, to deal with funding for next year. Yes, I think I'm content I'm content to proceed based on where we are at the moment. But but I, I think there there will come another point uh, before the first of April where we'll need confirmation of of live running funding for, for, for okay. next year, which we haven't yet got. And but just okay, to well, say we... they are they are active conversations at the minute though with the department uh, around next year. I'm perhaps if I could ask if we could explicitly uh, report back on those by uh, the next meeting in February, because by then I think all of those issues will be on a good critical path yes. if, if they're not resolved. Yeah, uh, Sally, would, I'm confident. I'm confident that we'll we'll have an answer by by that point. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you, Ian. You asked my audit chair's question about money, but your <laughs> um, your comment about uh, maternity services just triggered a, an extra thought that I think it, it's worth saying in public. So um, because of all the focus on maternity, quite rightly, a lot of different arms length bodies or organisations are thinking about maternity improvement. And I'm aware of some really good work that's happening between CQC, um, HSIB, Safe, 
Safety Investigation Branch and NHS Resolution, um, pooling their information and data around potential concerns ahead of inquiries. And I think that's a really important piece of work working together. If we can um, ensure that that continues a CQC and that you know we come back to talk about it at a more strategic level um, to support our employees in that endeavour, I think that will be really worthwhile. Thanks. Thanks, Sally. So, Ian, do you want to move on? To, I don't think there's any comment on that. But I think it was uh, I think other just 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 to just to agree with Sally that I think we recognise there's lots of people doing lots of work in this area. I, I think it is fair to say that that all of us at, at a senior level are very are, are very keen to ensure that we are joined up and that there are there are a lot that, that there's a lot of joint working which I think is a real positive. Uh, and we are looking to share and pool our, our work, whether it's ourselves, H to you know, the Nursing of Midwifery Council, the General Medical Council and so on. So we're trying to get as many of the players who can influence this agenda to, to come together. Uh, and, and that you know, people are, are, are definitely moving in the right direction. So it's, it's a good it's a good thing to uh, reinforce. Thank you. Um, so, Ian, if, you, if, you, if you're content, I'll, I'll move on to yep. the organisational matters report. So I'm on page 46 now of, of, our, of our board pack. Um, I think first, firstly, um, I, I just want to welcome uh, some some new new joiners. One of whom is here, Scott Duriraj. Scott's our new director of integrated care inequalities uh, and improvement. Although he's he's doing a particular particular project uh, for us, uh, it, which he'll come on to on a, in, on the agenda next. I'd also like to welcome uh, Chris Zakiti, our new director of mental health, and Lorraine uh, Tedeschini, director of op operations in the Midlands, and that and they they join uh, a number of of inter promotees and a number of, of colleagues uh, who've, uh, who, who've been remained in post uh, to produce, I think, uh, what is going to be a, a very effective uh, director team. And I'm really excited about, about some of the, the work that's already started. Uh, and and I'm, I, I think it gives us a really good leadership platform to, uh, to, to, to do really well on for the future. Um, I just want to also take uh, take the opportunity to publicly thank uh, uh, Rebecca Lord Jones, um, who, who I know is is uh, is will, will be leaving us very shortly. This will be her, her last meeting, and I know you'll want to say a few words at the end of the meeting, Ian. But um, but I think just worth saying from from my point of view, um, I, Rebecca's been with us for since 2013, and she's made a a really big difference, I think, to the board and to the wider wider organisation. And she's been, I think, firstly the legal architect behind a lot of the ways that that, that we work, and she's always that that quiet considered voice that that comes up with answers to uh, and answers to problems uh, she is definitely the the person that looks for answers which which i think we've all really appreciated but also i think it's also it's also fair to say that rebecca has a, a real lifetime of, of public service and has been has been the lawyer in the room for some recent quite significant historical events um, and 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 although she probably would never admit it can probably take credit for some for some really important legal decisions which which have have led to some really positive outcomes for many hundreds of thousands arguably millions of people in this country so um, I, I think it's um, it, it's a real tribute to Rebecca that uh, that she's she's done that I think we'll miss you Rebecca uh, I think on a personal level we'll miss you exec team will miss you and I'm sure all of the board members here will miss you and I think the public will be the poorer as a result of your retirement so uh, I wanted to wish you the very best of luck for the future um, and then final thing before before I, I just open it up to, uh, to, to other colleagues is I just want to just, just pay tribute to our wider operations group colleagues in particular who've had a really strong operational performance th this month. I know Tyson can talk to that in, in a moment if, if necessary, but um, I, I think it, given the fact we've just had, a, had a, an important conversation about the employee survey and some of the real challenges, uh, despite that, people have done some done some really good work, uh, and I think I think that's a, a real real testament to our, our colleagues. So I want to say a public thank you to them for the work that they've done. Um, so without further ado, I think Ian, I'm, I'm I think I'll stop there and uh, call colleagues in if they want to add to anything I've said, or of course answer questions. Thanks. Just one other thing, Ian. Do you want to make comment about Patricia Hewitt's review? 
Oh yes, of course. Um, we have uh, we have spoken to uh, spoken to the Patricia Hewitt review. Uh, I've spoken to Patricia Hewitt personally, but also uh, we, we've made made contact with the review. Uh, we've just seen the I think it was this morning the the call for evidence uh, came out, and we will be submitting evidence and supporting the review in a range of different ways um, because that we think it's con- entirely consistent with the work that we're we're aiming to do and the approach that uh, that we're, tr- we're aiming to take uh, with uh, ICS and LA Assurance. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Tyson. So thank you, Ian. Just just very briefly, can I reiterate um, the other Ian thanks to the operational teams for what was a really strong performance acro- across the month of November, given everything else that's going on and the complexity of, of their workload at the moment. So just for the record, the final tally of inspections for November has now come in and it's actually at 962, which is exactly 100 more than we managed in October and is our strongest performance since May rather than June, as it was before. And I'd also call out the 95% of whistleblowing alerts, which we're now meeting for the first time in, in, in the financial year. So we're meeting the KPI for the first time in the financial year. So really, really grateful, very strong performance, and, and we'll, we'll look to keep going. Yeah, I think it's particularly impressive in a way that, that we've already heard through the Pulse survey that a number of people have some problems or concerns, but, but they're not allowing that to uh, impact the work that they're doing. So uh, I think well done, everybody involved. Absolutely. Um, other questions for Ian or the executive team? No? All very quiet this time round. Well, we have plenty of other things on the agenda, so we can probably use the, the extra time. Um, uh, Ian and colleagues, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, Shall we move on to the um, uh, item 3.2, which is the independent uh, review? Um, it, again, down to note that this is one of these where uh, the, there's things to be told, but also we need to uh, agree and set out how we're going to agree some things that are relevant to this. Um, we agreed um, uh, at the outset that uh, although this is, is clearly an executive responsibility, that we would um, <coughs> ask Ali Hassan, one of our associate NEDs, just to provide some, some more direct hands on oversight on on behalf of the board. Um, so, Ali, I don't know whether uh, I perhaps just turn to you, see whether you have any introductory remarks. And then um, perhaps I could ask Scott Duraraj, who's been uh, patiently sitting on your screens, uh, to introduce himself and then say um, a little bit more about um, his approach to these reviews. Uh, and then we can open it up for questions from colleagues. Is that OK? So, Ali, I don't know if there's much to say but by intro, but, but perhaps I'll ask you to uh, give say a few words. Thank you, and I'll keep it brief. Um, we recognise that there are areas in which we can do better across how we listen, learn from, and respond to concerns raised inside and outside the organisation. And for us, this review that we're undertaking, which Scott will talk a bit more about in detail, is about making sure that we understand the right diagnoses to the challenges that we have, find the right ways forward, and embed them in the organisation. Um, we see an importance in getting this done and getting this done right. And we're undertaking two work streams, um, one fully independently and one across five work streams within our organisation to really help understand how we make things better. So, Scott, over to you. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Ian. Yeah, so from my uh, perspective and the way we're approaching this is really uh, following on from all the conversations we've had is connecting with the human impact uh, and the challenges that arose during the summer and how they affected uh, those individuals primarily and then how they uh, impacted on the core purpose and the values of the CQC. I think we've heard that we've got our staff have got great values and they're working really hard to meet that core purpose. And we've just heard that with some of the figures, but also the pulse survey. So uh, the review has been structurally designed to really directly respond to the challenges that arose uh, during the summer, connect with that human impact, but to really uh, acknowledge and address uh, the issues of credibility and confidence that had felt like it started to be eroded. And that is really important that we, as a, as a leadership and ourselves as a, a review team, uh, deal with issues of uh, inequality or racism and uh, the review in a way that's head on, that's competent, that's confident, uh, but looks for really meaningful 
transformation at the end of this. So we're not listening just to respond, but we are hearing and almost a sense of feeling as well to actually make sure that we deliver the improvements at the end of this. And that's really critical. And the reason why uh, it was felt really important that we we looked at moving to a, a level of independence, having an, an independent membership on the on the uh, review board was because, again, getting that voice and getting that honesty meets our values in the CQC about being honest and transparent and open, but also really committed to deliver the change that this review may uh, may report against. So, again, the, the review is in two phases, as Ali said. Phase one is the Zoe Leventhal uh, case, which is fully independent, and then there's five work streams under phase two. And to assure uh, colleagues and uh, people who are watching those, work streams will cut across some things that you've just heard talk about from the staff survey uh, to other inclusive leadership practices. But we're not duplicating. We've we've acknowledged those, but we are also building in uh, evaluation to every recommendation. And the evaluation, and again, listening to people externally, the key stakeholders has been an important part of that process. That the evaluation of those recommendations and the delivery of those recommendations are actually almost more important than everything else to make sure we make those improvements. So again, that's also. Uh, in train and um, uh, kind of being acted on. We've got primary stakeholders who have been engaged all the way through and are happy with the timelines and the changes we may have had to make during this to make sure this uh, review is robust, is credible and builds confidence. And I think that's really important to say that the value of this review is in meeting the values of the CQC and recognising the human impact in the first place. And that's the core process, really, that we're doing. The review has to be done right uh, and it has to be done uh, correct and proper. And the end output is really important for me that as that um, as the review comes out, that there's a level and a secure level of handover, monitoring and tracking. And I know the board are really keen on ensuring that evaluation piece going forward uh, to meet our, our organisational values, but also our commitment to the people who we are listening and hearing and of course, uh, making those improvements fall. Thanks, Scott. Uh, uh, Kate, uh, I rather skipped you, but you're the uh, and ultimately the executive overseeing this. Do you want to add anything to uh, what Scott and Ali have said before we move to questions? Um, the only thing I'd add is that this is incredibly important for us as an organisation. So you will see from the papers. Um, this is comprehensive. This is going wherever we need to go to in the organisation to make sure that we're responding to whistleblowing. We're doing speak up well. Uh, we've got the right culture. So I, I, the only thing I would want to add is this really matters uh, to us. Um, and, and I know it does to the board. And that's why uh, we have put in place such a robust plan that will come up with a set of recommendations that we will track, track through and ensure they are they are implemented as well. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Um, I have some comments and questions, and again, should let colleagues go first. Mark Saxon. Thank you, Chairman and Scott. Hello again, and uh, thanks for uh, presenting such a, a, a good paper. Um, I mean, I'm completely in agreement with you about the importance of external validation of the findings. It's absolutely um, uh, a critical part of, of what you're doing. But for the HR, the work stream for HR, you know, can I um, especially ask that this review looks at best practice in other organizations that brings it back into us rather than looking just internally at, at what we're doing? So I think that best practice and bringing that to us would be extremely helpful for us moving forward. Yeah, if I can come back. Thank you, Mark. And actually, I should have mentioned we, because uh, this is a fast moving programme, since the paper, we have now appointed the Workstream lead for Workstream 4, who is independent and got 20 years history working across numerous organisations, as well as a uh, employment tribunal panel member, and is certainly and most certainly looking at best practice uh, within these areas and within workforce. And when we come into inclusion, some of global best practice, actually, uh, because I think our workforce and the people we are here for deserve a world class service. And that's what our ambition is from this piece of work to really move forward on that. Thank you.
Scott, do you want to say a bit more about your um, contacts with um, uh, other stakeholders? And I suppose I'm specifically thinking of um, uh, well, Zoe is not exactly a stakeholder, but as a, a key player in doing phase one. Uh, we have mentioned publicly before we'd engaged her and it's referenced in the paper. But uh, I don't know if you'd like to say a little bit more about her work uh, and how that will feed into what you're doing. So that that's one question. And then the other is um, my understanding is that you have um, also been in touch with uh, Mr. Kumar. I don't know whether it's appropriate to say anything about that. Yeah, so um, I'll start with, with Zoe, uh, and I probably should have made really clear earlier that, of course, uh, Zoe Leventhal is an independent review. Uh, so as per that, the CQC uh, have very uh, limited responsibility over that because it is an independent review. So we have no editing powers and we will not have no editing powers from that. So although there is governance there, it's governance about the delivery and the oversight, and they're going to make some comment to that. So I think I just should have probably made that really clear. Yeah, I've engaged uh, with, with Zoe, and it, it's really important, again, because uh, we've had ambition uh, and recognition that these reviews are uh, the healthiest for all when they are timely. I think that's fair to say. However, some of those ambitions were established before uh, the independent reviewer Zoe was in place and before those terms of reference were agreed. And so obviously as that come in and as we are doing this robustly and correctly and values led, it has meant that the sampling, as, as I've talked about in the paper, has needed to change. And um, I have engaged uh, with Shyam Kumar, uh, who, who uh, you know, we have now a, a regular update, a regular brief, and I provide a direct contact. And we have got plans for Ali and Kate and myself uh, to meet with him, and he spent some time um, with Zoe. Uh, I think that's all I will say at this space, because that's Mr Kumar's information. But I, I have briefed him, and he has seen the papers before today, for instance. So from, for respect, we've got uh, what I would say is a, a very positive and productive working uh, relationship focused on the quality and the depth and the credibility of this review uh, and my commitment to him on making sure that is done in a robust manner. Um, it does mean, obviously, some of these timelines may shift, but if they do, they're, they're shifting because of a robust methodology. Uh, and Mr. Kumar is, uh, has been, and as, as discussed, with a level of contentment with that because it's important to get this done right, as I mentioned earlier. Thanks, Scott. Ian, do you want to comment? Thanks. I think just really to build build on what Kate was saying around how important this the, this piece of work is. I think it is important that, that we do this piece of work, but I think it's important this piece of work delivers uh, an outcome that we can stand behind and that we can deliver to all parts of the organisation. Because in some respects, it, it you know, we sometimes find that when when reviews are done in a very externalised kind of way. They, they they produce a report, but then it doesn't really get into the detail, into the tactical detail in the organisation. Um, for, for this, the, the, the way we're doing this review, I think, is quite unusual in, in some respects. There's there's a there's a big internal component, but there's a there's a very big external component, and we're, we're also drawing in uh, expertise from expert practitioners uh, as well as uh, I'm really grateful to Mr. Kumar for the way in which he's engaging with the with the review as well. So I think it does give us an opportunity to produce an outcome which is which is which has an element of independence to it but it also has a degree of pace to it but also it gives us that real insight that really detailed insight that we can we can deploy those insights really quickly uh, and it's also from a timing point of view it's a relatively short period of time but i think i'm hoping it will make a really big difference over that over that really short period of time but thanks Ian. i just wanted just to make that point about pace and timing yeah thanks I was going to ask you a question about pace. I might still come back on the point, but uh, thanks for just volunteering that. Uh, any uh, other questions or comments from colleagues? Uh, uh, um, one comment for me, and then by way of, of, of summary. Uh, firstly, a comment aimed more at, uh, at the public listening. I don't want to read the papers. We did say in there that the terms of reference were of these reviews were appended and indeed for a short while they were but I think we got a, a bit ahead of ourselves and what was posted hadn't actually been formally approved internally um, so uh, we will get these finalized we, we um, we're not going to go through the detail now but, but there will be a steering group that I've already mentioned that Ali will represent uh, as an independent non-exec to the board as a whole Kate is the executive responsible Scott uh, is leading all the phase two and Zoe as he's emphasised and it is important as an independent KC. 
uh, leading on, on phase one, which was clearly an important input. Um, the, since, um, so <clears throat> what I would like to suggest is that um, probably if, if um, Ali and I in particular representing the board, we could um, review and sign off on those uh, terms of reference and we'll aim to get those in the public domain in uh, probably on the website, let's say in by middle of January, something like that. So there's no need, I think, to wait for the next board meeting at the beginning of February. So that that's my way of a statement. And then just so um, I've got it clear, um, Ian, a question to Ian stroke Kate. Um, the um, probably we'd originally hoped that Zoe would be able to report you know, by about now this month. But we've, as I understand it, we've extended the scope of her work a little bit. And the pace at which she can move is to some extent determined by the ability to retrieve information and then go talk to people. And if people are on holiday, that's a constraint. So we, you know, we can't, um, I think we'd like to move faster at times, but but um, if you've committed to work with others, you can't then bypass them because they're not around. So my understanding is that um, we, in, in an ideal world, we'd like Zoe's work to be finished by the time of the next board meeting. That's an aspiration. It may not happen, but um, the we are should be in a position to say that all of this, so phase one and phase two, will all be completed by the end of March. Am mm -hmm. I correct in that understanding yes. from the paper? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So um, published terms of reference in January. We'll report back in February what we can, uh, but commit to getting it on by the end of March, which, Ian, I think plays back to your point. We need to, you know, we need to do this thoroughly, but equally we, we can't spend a year um, putting the, the bindings together and never acting. Um, unless there are any comments from colleagues, I've, just one other observation for me without labouring this, but I, I think there's a common link between this and the response to the staff pulse survey that neither of them make great reading. Um, but I do think it says um, something for the organisation that um, it's taking these head on and trying to deal with them in the best possible way. Um, Difficult anyway, but but we're doing it in the glare of the public eye. Um, so I think that's us. The the transparency with which that's being done, um, I think, is both a testament to the approach of the executive and the culture of the organisation. So thank you very much indeed for that. Ian, can I just say one thing to to finish? Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the trade unions actually and our disability staff network specifically who have helped us recruit uh, the network, uh, the workstream lead. Uh, the independent workstream lead for workstream four. Um, there was two colleagues, uh, uh, Suze and Dee, who helped from the uh, trade union at very short notice, and uh, both Paul, who's on the call today, and his colleague, uh, who helped again at short notice recruit. And I think this is that commitment uh, from our colleagues who may have faced a human impact from some of this work and who've engaged to help me with part of the solution as well. So I just wanted to thank them uh, publicly for their commitment. Uh, again, thanks very much, Paul and, and others. I mean, we're all in this together looking for a, a collective solution. So great. Scott, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, let's move on to um, the corporate performance report, um, which uh, and then we've one other item before we take a short comfort break. So, um, Kate, once again, I seem to be handing to you. Uh, this is more of a, of a to note, but you may want to bring Chris in, I'm sure. But can I ask you just to, to take us through this? Usual rules, we have read the paper, but what do you want to highlight? Yeah, so thank you, Chair. I'm going to do a fast handover um, to Chris. So this is our delivery through quarter two against our business plan. Um, I suspect we might want to spend a bit of time discussing risk, but let's see where the conversation goes. Um, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so I'll just uh, obviously report is, is there for board to, uh, to note and comment on. I'll just pull out a few areas as uh, for, for info. So um, as Tyson talked before, just about operational performance, we are starting to see uh, some good good uh, figures within uh, within operations. Nearly 20% of locations uh, have, have either been inspected or had a DMA call uh, to the end of November, which is on track to exceed last year. Uh, and when you factor in our public statements, that means 55% have had uh, a regulatory activity. Uh, that's on slide two of the deck. Uh, similarly, in registrations, uh, timeliness is reducing 
so our, our, sorry, our average time to uh, to handle registrations is reducing across all three categories that we deal with. Complex is 25%. Uh, down normal 4% and simple 4%. So that's, that's meaning that we're turning these around quicker than we've done before. And all of that's against a target reduction of 15%. Um, in terms of whistleblowing, uh, we are 95% uh, of whistleblowing have been actioned within five days, which is in line with our target. Uh, this is on, sorry, I'm uh, racing through. It's on slide nine of the, the deck. Um, that's an increasing trend, and you can see in August and uh, September, this was 98 and 99% uh, respectively, uh, so close to 100%. Uh, it's worth noting this obviously focuses on timeliness uh, and, and the work that Scott's just talked about in terms of the LLR review will obviously focus on more on impact and outcomes of those whistleblowing. Um, our report writing, so slide 13 in the deck, uh, again, continue to see a reduction in the average time to publish reports. Uh, or 20% 20, 20 reduction over the past 12 months. Um, just one obvious note to flag in terms of people deck, we, we've just talked about the Pulse survey mm -hmm. earlier in this uh, board meeting. We haven't, timing was slightly against us in terms of publishing that in this report. Uh, so the, there's a gap in this deck around the Pulse survey findings, but we'll include that uh, as, a, as a baseline in, in future reports. And, and Mark uh, Saxton, just a slight apology to yourself. You, you've asked for information on diversity of secondments. Uh, uh, we haven't managed to get that into this pack in time, but I know people, colleagues are working on that. So apologies. I know you've asked that previously and I've assured you it would, it would be in. We, we will get that in for the next uh, the next report. And then just to close in terms of the uh, uh, financial position, uh, we're underspent um, year to date, largely due to the profile of income received, but we're forecast, forecasting that that'll be close to budget by the end of the year with a, a 0 0.1 million surplus. Um, Ian, you'd, you'd asked uh, previously as well about the, the how our how our activities funded. Uh, I'll, I'll include this in the report going forward, but just for, for, for reference, we have uh, ten percent of our activity, about ten percent, nine ten percent, is uh, is not uh, financed through the fees that we charge to providers, uh, and it's activity that is funded by the department through grant and aid. Um, and the last bit for me uh, before opening out is just on capital. Uh, we are forecast to overspend. Uh, we are currently overspent and forecast to overspend about four and a half million for the year. Uh, we are monitoring that ex uh, very closely and in conversation with the department. Uh, about any options there are to mitigate that pressure for the year. We'll, I'll pause there. Just on that last point, so you're, you're flagging that we are overspending, but at the moment you don't see that as a major issue for the board? Not from the conversations I've had with the department, no. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions or comments from colleagues? Linda. Hi. Uh, hi, Chris. On uh, the business plan overview, one of the points is improved percentage of inspections to learning disabilities and autism services out of hours. Do you think that we should include other services in that, such as the mental health services, secure services, and other areas at risk of close cultures? I can see you bursting to answer that, Kate. Yeah, yeah, I am, <laughs> Melissa. Um, so, I, so I really, I really believe that there should be a strong component of out of hours of a, a lot of our work because uh, it's absolutely critical that we get out and and observe care um, at all points of the the week, be it evenings, Saturdays, Sundays, etc. So, um, we we kicked off this this out of hours, this focus on learning disability and autism services. We now need to absolutely have it for other uh, settings where people live. Often that that does happen, you know, uh, inspectors run over or they start early, but I'm quite keen that we uh we in regulatory leadership in partnership with Tyson and the Ops Group are clear on what our ambition is. You know, what, what does good look like? Would we expect that, for example, 30% or 40% of any service where someone lives would have an out-of-hours component of an inspection, just as a, a for example? So that is a conversation we will be having going into 23, where um, between us, um, we need to uh, think about what the ask is. And then between Tyson and the people team, we just need to check out that um, that's an OK thing to ask for our, our colleagues and, and to make sure that that's that's all um that can be handled in a way that's safe and is and, and, and is an acceptable ask but if it's okay chair if i can just check whether tyson um whether tyson has a different view to what i've just said that'd be fine <laughs> tyson 
I couldn't have put it any better myself, but just, just to reiterate, um, Belinda as well, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, we're doing a piece of work about how we can, um, I guess, have proper, to, proper terms and conditions for our people when we're expecting them to work, work in the middle of the night, for example. So not, not out of hours in terms of just before the start of the working day or just after, but real, real out of hours work. And we need to make sure there's, um, access to supervision and, and that we keep, we keep our people safe. But I completely agree. We should, we should be, we should be doing more of this and very happy for it to be measured. Thanks. You add that to your list, Chris. Uh, Mark Chambers. Thank you, uh, Chris. It's, I mean, this is great, and every time I think we look at this, um, it's an improvement on the uh, on uh, the previous report. So it's great to to, to see this. Uh, j just sort of one question, if I, if I might, on page eighty three on the publication. Um, uh, data you know it's great to see uh average days to publish coming down but the the numbers of things that we're getting out of the door have, have come down as well we heard earlier about a fantastic performance in terms of productivity where's our kind of lead indicator to be comfortable that that isn't going to spike back up again or am i missing something Shall I, shall I come in again, Chris? I, I think the lead indicator for me, Mark, is, is the timeliness of, of the reports. And so what, what are the oldest reports in the system? Um, and we've been trying to, as I would call it, bring the tail in for some time now. All of, all of the outstanding reports are within this financial year for, for the first time. And I think what we've got here is probably seeing a slightly lower inspection activity in July and August, which is now coming down in the, the number of reports being put out in September. I would, I, I'll, I'll get the October figure for you but i would expect october and november to be higher but but the timeliness of reports is improving and the oldest reports in the system are, are getting younger I, I that's very helpful uh, you know variance is what kills you here and so yeah. it's, it's good that you're tracking the tail thanks thank you sally Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian, and uh, thanks, Chris and colleagues, um, for a very comprehensive report. It definitely does get better. I had um, one general point about impact. So um, other colleagues have already mentioned, but it's my last meeting, so I'm going to make the most of it. We have <laughs> to um, we do have to count things, but we do have to think about the impact. And I think this report is still in a bit of a counting phase. And I think if we can start to think about how we show the impact that we are definitely having um, in this type of report, that would be really helpful. Um, and I'm, I welcome the bit about risk, which says we will be reporting in a new type uh, of way around risk next time, which is also a positive step forward and will relate back to our strategy and can think about impact. So first of all, impact I had two small points. Um, I think I read somewhere and I can't find it now that we were pausing some of our direct monitoring activity. I think it's to transfer resources, but I just wanted to check that with Tyson. That was a question. And um, the second bit was that we've seen an increase in give feedback on care. And if I'm understanding the slide right, we've had a lot more positive responses about the quality of care. So I just wondered if someone could comment on that and whether I've got that right or not. Thanks. Shall, shall I, nice shall I pick up? First. Yeah. Shall I pick up on the on the on the, D, on the DMA point? Um, no, no, we're not pausing um, DMA activity. What what we have, we have a a, a, a bit of a smaller team than we've had um, for a while, partly because the bank inspectors are now working on our registration priorities, and and where people have left the team naturally, we've not replaced them from within the inspection directorates because of the um, the pressures that they're under at the moment. But the t the team are still are still working on DMAs, and that's the plan. Um, the the DMA inspectors will move into the integrated teams when we move into the integrated teams in March, but they will continue to work on DMAs with some national oversight until, until we uh, adopt the regulatory platform late, later on in 2023. So we're, we're, still, using the, we're still using the DMA. And, and, and on the good give feedback on care point, Sally, I think one point I would make is that actually I think the, the DMA activity might well be driving up some of the more positive um, feedback because a, a part of the preparation for, for the DMA is asking 
asking providers to seek be- feedback about their performance. And so I think we're getting more performance and you may well more, more feedback. And some of that may actually be the more positive feedback that people wouldn't normally surrender if, um, if they hadn't been prompted for it. I just come back on the your point about outcomes, Sally. Uh, just to say, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, we had conversations with each board member about uh, future planning, future measures, and that was uh, resounding feedback to us, of which we completely endorse. Uh, so that's what we're aiming for for the future. Our, our ability to capture those outcomes is 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 what we're trying to uh, deliver on, which is why the balance is probably out at the minute. But it's definitely something we are working towards. Just to build on on Tyson's point around give feedback on care, also as part of the thematic work, we are looking for examples of innovation and good practice. So we're, in a sense, we're looking for some of those um, people's experience of how services have improved and changed. I think, to be fair, though, Sally, there's still more that we're that we're seeing that comes from people's concerns about care. Uh, but it, but that I think it's important that we can. Um, we can look for both and uh, and certainly in terms of driving improvement, it's important we can see why and how services change and improve and how they bring people who use them uh, with them. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mark Saxton. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Chris, for preempting my question and knowing that I would go to chart 88 on uh, <laughs> in your pack. Um, but I... And to Sally's point, uh, you know, it might look as if I'm looking uh, just to count things, but actually the things I want to count do have an impact as well. So that's why I've asked you to um, uh, go after the promotions and the acting ups and, uh, in, in terms of uh, ethnicity and, and uh, disability so, uh, you know, so that we can measure what we're doing. Um, and may I also say, and I'm sorry, Chris, that another chart is missing that's normally in this pack, and that is our recruitment performance across ethnicity and uh, disability, and that has an impact on us as an employer as well. So I, you know, I think it's it's really good if we keep those that chart coming back into this pack so that we can monitor that performance. But thanks, it's a, it's as always, Chris, a, a very thorough report. So thank you. Chris, there are a few, um, I'm not sure Mark's comment needed an answer as such, but um, I, we have talked about other changes on reporting. Uh, it would probably be helpful to make sure we do have a suitably standardised pack so that we make sure we're reporting it so we want to report against, not just what somebody manages to pull together. We're making changes in any event to our risk framework, so that will probably impact some of this reporting in any event. So. Um, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but am I right in thinking that, that uh, maybe the beginning of next financial year that some of this will look a bit different? Uh, yeah, that's the plan. I mean, it's constantly evolving, so we're trying to enhance the reporting through this year and the look and feel of it. But I think coming back to the heart of the measures that still work that we're building in uh, ongoing and, and we'll have a new performance framework and reporting on this uh, against a new business plan for next year, hopefully focus on more outcome measures and, as I said, against a risk framework as well. In terms of Mark's point around uh, the people's side, um, we'll take that away and apologies. That was an oversight. I think we need to get into a better rhythm around what do we report through a corporate performance pack and what do we do as part of a people plan update, of both of which are uh, kind of regularly coming to the board. So it may be that we give certain metrics in our performance update and a wider set of data that you're searching for as part of the people plan update. But I'll pick that up outside and make sure we, one way or another, we've got the, the information that you're seeking. OK, thanks, Chris. Uh, Stephen Marston. Thanks, Ian. Um, two points. The first one may be just a kind of different reflection on, on the, the Sally Chris discussion. I suppose just sort of looking at page 71 in the pack, it's very green. And for me, that's kind of setting up a bit of a disjunction about what we know about the stresses and strains on the services that we're dealing with. Now, 
that's because actually what this business plan is doing is sort of looking at the things that are within CQC's power to deliver and measure and control. And you, we are doing much of that well. I guess it may be that when we get through to next year's plan and a greater focus on impact, just that that sense of slight disjunction between a, a very green dashboard while well, knowing all of the pressures that, that the service is facing may may reduce a bit when we start looking at the impact that we're having for for improvement and and gain. Um, the other point I just wanted to raise is page 73, which got me interested because of the regional difference in percentage of services rated good or its standing. Um, Northeast 91, West Midlands 83.5, quite a big gap. And that got me sort of thinking, well, where does where does that where does that go? Where do we take that in terms of trying to work out well what's going on in those different regions that we or ICSs or anybody else could could learn from? Because for me, that's really quite an interesting uh, uh, element. There's there's something that the Northeast is getting right that the West Midlands apparently aren't. How do we work that out and then sort of take it back out to the system? Kate, uh, look like you want if, to come in If on I that. could. Um, so, uh, Steph, who, who you'll know from Chris's team, has been busily uh, working away at what a map looks like across the country when you look at provider ratings within ICSs, so within integrated care systems, to draw out that very point, Stephen, around variation. And you can cut it a number of different ways. You can look at variation across adult social care services, across hospitals, etc. So that, um, that data is available already. I think where I get excited is when I think about our new powers uh, from April 23 onwards, is how we might use that data and insight we have about quality of providers at presented at an ICS or a local authority level to invite those ICSs to do that, to, you know, to either get involved if there's areas that need improvement, to learn from best practice from, from other ICSs. So I think it's critical that we always use the insight that we have because of our unique position to then make that as accessible for um, organisations, groupings such as ICSs who can then take that and, and, and do something with that information as, as well. Um, I don't know, Chris, stay whether you want to come in on the back of that, because I know your team help a lot with um, that sharing of data also. Yeah, <clears throat> I think what is, what is useful with this, it, it picks up two things. <clears throat> we need to understand both the underlying health inequalities in an area, uh, how, the how the individual organisations are performing and how the ICS and local authority plans support the improvement of an area. Um, taking into account the health inequalities that exist. And I think what we've got at the moment is some of the information around how services are performing. And I think we're getting an improving picture of the underlying health inequalities in an area. So, for example, ironically, the West Midlands has a has proportionately a lower um, uh, or sorry, higher health health inequalities than elements of the northeast, even though you might think they're actually quite similar. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you think if you add into that the fact that it has uh, poor performing and more reductions in uh, elements of adult social care than the northeast. You can begin to see why there may be differences that exist there. But I think the real opportunity here and the real excitement is to pull these in essentially quite disparate pieces of information that sit uh, across different organisations together to form a common understanding of how areas are performing and why. And I think in that way, we can provide the best guide to ICSs and local authorities and, and enable them to provide the best service for, for people in their local areas. Thanks. Chris, um, I had a number of detailed questions and most of them are being covered by my colleagues. So we obviously look for some of the same things. Can I just um, ask uh, two more? What I think is a view, one might be for um, Tyson. On page 74, it's headed up. Uh, the the rating uh, does not match the predicted risk. D do you mean predicted or previous? So if it's previous, that's factual. If it's predicted, how are we going about um, making that prediction? I'll start there. I'll give you the other one later. Yeah, so it is predicted. It's based on... Uh, I mean, Mark might want to talk to this better than me, but it's based on the algorithms, I think, that determine what, what a risk profile is 
uh, the, uh, the, the three bandings that we're operating with. So um, it, it's based on that algorithm coming through in terms of predicted risk. So this is taking what Tyson previous plus extra information we've now received as to what it would be. So it's so it's we we have uh, kind of algorithms telling us three bandings of uh, uh, profiling our, our, our uh, services over three bands, high, medium, low, for want of a better word. Um, we are doing sample inspections of the so in a band one you wouldn't inspect you would do a published statement um, which would go onto our website we are sampling some of those band one services uh, to see what we find on inspection to test whether uh, what we are uh, how we are our algorithm and how we're assessing that risk is is correct or not um, so we'll sample some of those inspections and similar to band two where we do a DMA call we again we'll be sampling some of them by doing an inspection Okay, I perhaps misunderstood the, uh, the chart. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I was also intrigued by the, the big increase in positive outcomes on page 76, but that's been mentioned. Uh, and then my last one on page 79 in the pack, uh, this is uh, percentages of action taken to mitigate risk. I mean, it, it, it's great that uh, the percentages increased really quite markedly. Uh, I wondered if um, Tyson, either you or one of your colleagues could say a bit more about why that significant improvement and, and what do we define as action for the purposes of this presentation? Um, I mean, I think I think the performance on this measure is is strong because I think there's been a particular focus on it over, over the last few months. And um, I mean, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of focus on one whistleblowing across the board in in, in the commission, and I think that, that that's a good sign of that. Um, in terms of what what the actions are, I think there are a number of categories. In terms of in some cases, um, alert alerting the provider so that they're they're aware and they can they can address um, they can address what the what the problem is. And there, there will be other actions that, that we will take, um, but I think this is this is one of those measures that doesn't measure out, outcome. And I think there is some work that we are now doing. Um, there's a new um, colleague, Haley Moore, who's working um, for Kate in regulatory leadership on safeguarding, who is looking at what, what we do as a result of the actions that are taken. It's not just good enough to do something within five days. We want to make sure that the quality of our overall contribution um, to safety is, is right. And so that that's the qualitative element. And this is very much the quantitative, but there's been a real focus on this and on safeguarding over the last few months, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we, we've got the figures up. Oh, well, obviously, it was behind my question as to if you um, <coughs> there could be many reasons for uh, an increase in uh, ability to, to to respond. It depends on the quality of response. Yeah, the case yeah. looks like you want to come in as well. Yeah, if I could just link this. So, so um, the Scots update earlier, uh, one of the work streams is around whistleblowing, and it is doing. Sally, is your outcomes point? So this counts the numbers. So check: Are we taking an action within five days? Uh, the work that sits under this whistleblowing work stream is interviewing whistleblowers. How did mm -hmm. they experience their dealings with us? It's really testing ourselves. It says, you know, in an X number of cases, you ask, you invite a provider to investigate. Is that is that the right thing? Does that get the best outcome? So we are doing that um, really detailed piece of work uh, to really challenge ourselves around the actions we are taking, because this statistic looks great and it's fabulous that our teams are getting on and taking action and it's being recorded as such. And um, the, the work in the review that Scott was talking about is us uh, really uh, scrutinising our approach to how we how we action whistleblowers to make sure that we're getting the best um, outcomes for them and for the services they're often raising concerns about. And I guess there's also a link here to the work that Scott was talking about earlier on as well, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, no more questions. Uh, let's conclude that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, one last thing before we take a short comfort break. We have a um, transformation and people update. So, Kate and Mark, you're on the line. I think Amy Pritchard was going to join us. I can't immediately see her. Here we go. Amy. Welcome. Here. Hello. Perfect Hello timing. Um, <laughs> Great. So, Kate, uh, hand over to you. We've got um, 15 minutes, maybe, um, yeah. not more. Uh, so, over to you. 
Okay, so um, quite rightly, we often hone in on what we need to do better and what is slipping. But I think it's important in these um, kind of quarterly updates that we also celebrate some significant achievements that have been delivered over the last quarter. So um, I'm going to invite Amy to, to kind of shine a spotlight on a couple of those. And I imagine Mark will come and want to come in also. Uh, but we'll also flag um, uh, some areas that we're doing some more work on and when we'll be able to talk about that a bit more in the kind of coming weeks and months. So over to you, Amy. Lovely. Um, thank you very much, Kate. So um, over the last quarter, a lot of our efforts focused on how we'll manage the rollout of our new regulatory model, uh, which will deliver the key elements of our new strategy. Um, so we've been really grateful to the support of colleagues, providers and other partners who have all given us feedback over this period that's really enabled us to strengthen our approach to this rollout. We're particularly grateful to colleagues in ICSs and local authorities who have been helping us to shape our approach to assessment in this space. Um, and we're really starting to now think about what we can do uh, by the start of April next year to apply some of this thinking. Um, internally, our work to transition colleagues into integrated teams is on track uh, to happen in March. And all colleagues now know what their new roles are in those teams. This represents um, the first phase of the journey for people in moving towards that new regulatory approach, and there will be subsequent phases over the course of the next year. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, um, we've taken an enormous amount of time over the last quarter to really reflect on how well the transformation programme has worked to date. And as a consequence, we've really strengthened our practice and adapted our approach to roll out, making it more sensitive uh, to the load that we are placing on providers and people, um, and to also really deliver a, a much improved user experience. So in summary, um, we'll be looking to talk about our revised timings with the organisation, providers and others um, over the course of the next month. So I'll just invite Mark in to see if there's anything you'd like to add, and then we can take questions. Thank you. Just to just talk a little bit more about that, the, the reg, regulatory platform. As Amy said, we've you know, we've run that early adopters activity with the subset providers in our registration in our notifications process, so we can learn we can learn from that experience, and that's exactly what we've done. And that work will allow us to to course correct and deliver new services, which are really fully incorporating of that feedback from providers and from external parties. Um, the important thing to note is that the, the foundation of what we've built is really secure. We've got a number of live services that we're already running on this Dynamics 365, this regulatory platform environment that that is facilitated by that, that foundational work, the, uh, the environments, the data structures, the migration of data from our legacy systems. Uh, and that includes products that... Um, uh, people will be familiar with our direct monitoring activity and new maternity safety assessments. And we're continuing to build on those. We're building some new new life services around our mental health focused assessments as well. So we've got a solid data and technology foundation. And we're looking forward to how we can extend this to new services, end to end services and and deliver our single assessment framework. Um, I'd also like to highlight the really great work that's been done on our Transforming Data and Insight program. Um, that has been about building a, a, a new capability uh, made of a new capability of, uh, of people and the technology that supports that. And throughout this year, we've delivered a, uh, a, new, a new structure. Uh, we have new heads up in place in our, in our data and insight capability. We've got a new enterprise data platform, which we've, uh, we've delivered, and we're making you know, really significant progress in migrating from our legacy insight reports into our new Microsoft Azure and Power BI environments. All of our new services are now being built in that environment and that transition is making really good progress and will be completed by the end of this financial year. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So turn to my colleagues, any questions or comments for the team? Ian, you want to add? Thanks. Just just to reinforce the point that Mark was was making about the the importance of things like data taxonomy, or that that database management activity that that, that Mark talked about. It's it's quite easy to say, but the the practicalities of doing this and maintaining the integrity of data as you go from old system to new system, it's really important foundational work. Um, and and the work we're doing 
with the uh, things like the maternity program, for example, are testing that end to end integration. So I think that's a that's a really important message. And I, I think sometimes we, we probably just see that as being quite simple work. But actually, there's a there's an awful lot to it when we've got some billions of documents that that uh, from our regulatory history that we need to carry forward and we need to carry forward the um, uh, ca carry forward the the the, uh, the the codification and systematization of this in a way that we can then start to form these these long term views uh, and long term uh, national views of what's going on and as because well, we are we're doing two things here really we are making sure that we can continue to um, to run our our day to day let's look at a provider, let's, rate, let's, let's regulate and rate a provider. But we're also starting to think about what, how we can start to aggregate that information together and also report at things like ICS level, at regional level and, and at national level. And none of that would be possible without some of this really, really, really hard end data management activity. And of course, the, the group of people that work, work for Mark in, in the, um, in, in the data, data and insights team that are, that are starting to bring this together and be able to process this information information uh, the, the group people we don't often talk about but I think a huge tribute to the, the work that they've done uh, well I guess this means going into next financial year when we come to look at the business plan that will include now quite a bit of the, the back end of um, completing this and uh, turning it into business as usual by you know orders of magnitude probably halfway through the next financial year is that right Okay. Any other questions from colleagues? Okay. Well, Amy, um, we let you off very lightly. Thank you very much okay, indeed okay, for okay. joining us. Okay. Thank you. See you all later. Yeah. Bye bye. So, um, why don't we, I think we'd only allowed about a five minute comfort break. That's probably a bit mean. Um, at the risk of running behind schedule, why don't we uh, try to recommence? Absolutely. If I say at 22, no later than if people could be back. It gives you a chance to uh, go warm up. Thanks very much. Welcome back. Uh, for anyone listening to the live uh, 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 webcast, um, welcome back to you as well. Um, the next session is an update from uh, Louise Ansari, who's the Director of HealthWatch England. Just before I hand over to her, I thought I might just uh, mention that as we've already touched on, Robert Francis, of course, retired from uh, his role as chair of HealthWatch England in the uh, middle of November. Um, I also mentioned earlier the department is in the process of recruiting a successor. Uh, just to uh, provide the right links to uh, between HealthWatch England and the board, uh, we've asked Belinda Black, one of our existing non-executive directors, to act in a an interim uh, chair role until such time as we have a full time appointment. So um, she is actively engaged. Um, Belinda, if you want to say anything later, uh, please do. Uh, but I won't ask you to say anything at this stage. I'll just hand straight over to Louise. So, Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here online to talk to you today. I'm not going to go through the report, which I'm sure you've read, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. What I'm going to do very briefly, um, because I know that you are very interested in the impact that, that HealthWatch has, is talk about one example of the significant impact that a local HealthWatch has had. Um, we had our HealthWatch Week and our HealthWatch Awards recently, and we had some just phenomenal examples of the, of the difference people can make. So I'll be very brief. It's, it's, a, it's um, a really interesting example. The HealthWatch Sunderland have got regular sessions with an organisation called Sunderland People First. And they heard from uh, Sharon, who's got a learning disability, um, after she received um, a, a mammogram, she had a recall letter. And she couldn't understand the letter. It was in the complicated jargon that um, the NHS sometimes sends its letters out in. And she felt that she had to uh, uh, ask somebody else to explain the letter to her, which meant that she felt her independence had been taken away effectively. So in response, HealthWatch Sunderland um, worked with several NHS teams, those at the local breast care clinic and the PHE screening services, and discovered that there are actually three standardised recall letters 
uh, after a mammogram, none of which are in easy read format. And so what the team did, along with uh, with Sharon, is actually support Sharon to explain to the people who who create easy read and who create uh, callback letters that she couldn't understand them. And she helped uh, the teams. Sharon helped the teams draft easy read recall letters. So it, this actually took a couple of years to do. And it was the persistence of uh, Sharon and Healthwatch Sunderland uh, that have uh, that have brought about this change, which means that easy read letters are now uh, available to be sent out to uh, to women who have mammograms. And that means that all people with learning disabilities can now understand what's actually uh, what's actually happened. So this doesn't, in, in my view, highlight the incredibly important role of Health Watch and change, but also of the of the role Health Watch has in enabling service users themselves to be part of the change. And there are hundreds of examples of this up and down the country. Uh, if any members of this board would like to visit a local Health Watch and hear about some of those examples, we'd be very happy to facilitate that. Um, but just after a, after a, my first year in, in post, I'm always very uh, inspired uh, by these kinds of stories. So I thought I'd share one with you today. But as I say, very, uh, very happy to answer any questions about the fuller report, uh, Chair. Sorry, Louise, I've had problems sometimes unmuting myself today. At least I realised today before I spoke. So <laughs> thank you very much for, uh, for that story and other things. So we have your report. Um, comments from colleagues. Ali. Thank you, Louise, for a great update as always. Um, and it's good to hear about the work that's being done. I noted that when we looked at the section that talk about supporting the Health Watch network and improving data collection, um, there it's noted that many Health Watchers are unable to afford pay for systems. And certainly we know that Health Watchers do excellent work um, mm. for very constrained budgets and deliver a great return on them too. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about, I suppose, how the challenges around funding more widely affecting health watch at present and how you see, I suppose, that evolving in the future. Thank you, Ali. Shall I answer as we go along, Chair? Yeah, if you could. So that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night is, is financial sustainability for the Health Watch Network. Um, and it's not just um, being able to finance uh, good data collection systems and we're working hard to support them on on um, on cost free ways of doing that, uh, um, as well as providing them with other kind of data platforms. But it's their often their actual ability to do their statutory role well. And with our uh, our committee and with with Belinda as, as interim chair, we spend a lot of time discussing what the what we can do to support their financial sustainability. Some health watch, some of the smallest health watch are running on around about 60,000 a year, which barely covers their ability to actually have a, a you know, fully functioning organisation. And then others are on three or four hundred thousand. And the variation is staggering. I, I find it. And it doesn't particularly it doesn't particularly match deprivation or the populations they're serving. So some of the things that we're trying to do in that space are talking to um, commissioners of local health watch, who are of course local authorities, and to the Department of Health um, to escalate where we have concerns about commissioning at to lower level, and what the Department of Health can do to uh, go back to the commissioners and provide clearer guidance about the level of commissioning. We also produce an annual report called the State of Support, which gives a huge amount of detail around the country about how much funding every single health watch has and most of them use that the lower the lower funded ones use that to provide comparative information uh, with their local authorities we also support them in other fundraising activities many of them are charities uh, and many of them uh, do get funds from other sources including some funds on project work from the cqc so there's a program of work ongoing to try and support them in financial sustainability and we'll continue to try and find creative ways to do that. 
thanks, Louise. Uh, Belinda. Thanks for that story, Louise. It, it really shows the impact that local health watchers have when they got some resources to do the job properly. And uh, it's really nice to hear that story. But my question is not even related to your report, really. It's related to uh, the upcoming nurses strikes. And I wonder if the local health watchers have said anything back to you or you've had direct concerns yourselves from members of the public. Thank you, Belinda. And we've actually um, um, been very, tried to be very um, careful and evidence based in what we say. So uh, we've been very careful in terms of ensuring that our position is based on what we know at the moment. Um, uh, however, today we wrote to uh, Pat Cullen, General Secretary of the RCN, with some concerns about the possible variation in the provision of, of um, life protecting care in, uh, in hospitals around the country, and also about the confusion that that might that, and anxiety that people are going to be uh, experiencing when they're not entirely sure whether or not they're going to get chemotherapy or or what's available on a bank holiday as they've been describing it. So following the letter we sent to Pat Cullen this morning, I had a meeting with um, Nicola Ranger, who's the Deputy Chief Executive of, of the RCN, and she committed to uh, both national and local strike committee level further communications to patients and the public about what they could expect. So um, we we may say more about this as as if the strikes happen and we understand the impact more. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're happy that the RCN has been open to our approach and is committing to try and uh, improve communications. We have been in fairly constant contact with NHS England, who have uh, who have put now at our request and the request of HUK and others a Q and A on their website to explain what the exact state of play is at the moment. And we're continuing to talk to them about their request to trusts in terms of local communications. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Louise, and, and thanks, Belinda. Um, uh, Mark Saxton. Thanks, Chairman, and hi, Louise. Good to see you again, um, and very thorough report. Louise, I was really interested in the work you've been doing around maternity services. And as you know, we in CQC are um, very much engaged in uh, working with the maternity services from a patient safety point of view. And uh, we've done a lot of work in terms of bringing maternity staff together and learning. And uh, we have a special maternity um, uh, service uh, inspection program. I just wondered, uh, are we connecting with each other here? Because I'm sure we could both learn off each other. Thank you, Mark. Yes, absolutely. And um, thinking about the state of care, you know, the, the really impactful um, CQC report where we, we all fed in what we knew and what we know about maternity um, services and people's experiences of that uh, into that report as well. Currently, what we're doing is collecting people's experiences of uh, maternity and mental health, because um, before my time, Health Watch England uh, influenced NHS England to try and ensure that people would get a six week check on their mental health, even if they've got pre-existing mental health conditions or uh, their mental health was uh, 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 poor because of uh, anything to do with maternity or, or um, having having a child. And we don't believe that that's happening uh, around the country in the way it should be, but, you know, for lots of reasons, workforce issues and a range of reasons. So we've just um, we've been reaching out and Local Health Watch have been talking to individuals in, in a kind of deep dive and getting uh, kind of case studies of people's experience. We are very pleased to say we've ha we've actually had several thousand people contact us. Uh, with their experience of maternal mental health. So we're going to be in a position um, in the new year to give a pretty comprehensive report of the experience of, of new mothers and whether or not their mental health is being taken care of. And we'll absolutely work with Chris and Jill Morrell and the team to make sure that we link up with the work that the CQC is doing on, on maternity uh, and, and consider what we can do together going forward. Thanks, Louise. Well done. Sally. Thank you. And hi, Louise. 
Um, we had the pleasure of your team coming to our audit committee last week to report on risk and um, governance assurance. So, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for that. You always bring a really good um, sense of the risks you face in a great level of detail. It's always up to date and they're always very eloquent. So uh, this is actually my last meeting as a CQC board member. But I just wanted to place um, my thanks on record to you and the team for the way that you've approached audit and the way that you report to us. So thank you for that. Um, secondly, I just had a question about social care just to um, raise it up here really in public. So I know you are Health Watch, um, but you've talked a little bit about your campaign around access to social care by councils um, or the NHS. And Kate might want to comment as well, potentially. But it's really interesting, isn't it, that if there is that unmet need where we signpost people and whether we could get a bit more publicity about that, uh, particularly over the winter period. Thanks. Thank you, Sally. And just um to say how much we valued your support as the chair of the CQC audit committee and your and your challenge, um, and in such a, a sensitive but properly challenging way, really really appreciate that over the years. Um, from a social care point of view, you're absolutely right. There is still this level um, of uh, not understanding where to go for social care, how to ask for it, um, and that also matches to some extent with the problem of. Uh, what the definition of need is uh, from coming out of the department and then that being evenly applied across the country by local authorities. So that may well be a direction we're going in trying to determine what um, what a clear definition of unmet need is, which would then support um, people receiving the proper level of social care. So that I mean, that there's there's um, yes, even though we're called Health Watch. And uh, various people do say this to me, you know, we need to make sure that we are clear that we are here on social care as well. And actually, during Health Watch Week, and as we're in a, a, a strategy sort of renewal cycle at the moment, a large number of people have said to us, you also need to focus on social care. So make that an important part of what you do in the future. So we're still exploring what more we can do, taking into account that local Health Watch do have this power of enter and view in social care facilities, but also what we can do at a national level and what is a very um, complex picture where nobody seems to quite have the, the comprehensive political will or levers to pull to, you know, make the requisite changes in the in the in the system and the, you know the the market and the and the workforce. So we are trying to sort of hone down on where we might actually be able to make a difference. Information and advice on where to go is probably one area, but a definition of, of of what is need and what's unmet need may well be another. Kate? Just a, just a super quick um, reminder. So obviously, when we start doing local authority assurance, then we will have the ability to um, uh, consider how local authorities are meeting their care act requirements. So it's set out really clearly in legislation what is a what is a statutory need that should be being uh, met, um, and and the kind of fresh insights we'll be able to bring from April uh, 23 will hopefully enhance um, the kind of transparency and the understanding about what that variation potentially looks like across the, the country as well. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. I think it's the end of the comments uh, up there. I, I one last comment, really, rather than question from me, Louise. But I mean, obviously, um, we talked before. Uh, I, certainly, I talked to you, and I think in this format about the uh, role of Health Watch England with the new care system. So I think you will be inputting to the uh, Hewitt review, uh, and then a meeting we were attending the other day outside the board. Uh, I think we've agreed we'll. You know, Chris's team and others will just make sure that, uh, or, or Joyce, whoever it is, are going to make sure that we uh, facilitate giving your feedback into that review. So that's more of an observation, unless you wish to comment on it. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we've met with the with the review team, and we're we're um, we're getting our response ready. So the team will definitely be talking to the CQC colleagues about that. Okay, right. Thank you. All right, well, Lise, thank you very much for joining us. Um, usual uh, helpful report and. Uh, We'll see you in a few months' time, if not before. Thanks. Thank you. Bye for me. Um, we now have a an update from our CQC equality networks. Uh, I think Paul Kirby, um, who I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, is 
sitting in as a, 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 a attending or listening of representing all the networks. Anyway, he's probably going to lead off on this, but I'm just going to ask Kate Tironi to introduce it. And then I think we're just going to have a couple of minutes each from a number of people. Is that right, Kate? It is indeed, yeah, it's fabulous. Um, so thank you much, so much, colleagues, for joining us. Um, so you're going to hear a kind of forward view from each of the uh, from a, uh, each of the network chairs about what their priorities are for 2023. And also, I'm really pleased to introduce Nadia. You heard at our earlier people plan update that we'd appointed a new diversity and inclusion manager, who's Nadia, who has just been called into into the meeting now. So we might just loop back at the end to ask her to intro herself. But without further ado, I'm handing over to Paul who will then do his bit and then he'll hand round to colleagues so they all have their, their couple of minutes. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've introduced before as the Disability Equality Network's Chair. Um, before I go to the priority, it's been a real tough year, the network of change. And um, I'm, from the previous meeting you've had is the Vice Chair, Karen Hill, has expressed that sort of concern that some of them are struggling and coping differently and to adapt. Uh, the DEN leadership team, myself, Karen and Monica, is trying to work hard with the network to gain confidence as well as steering sort of positivity, learn the negative but work with the positivity. But what's really great coming from it is a lot of those hidden gems that need to be looked at, for example, the reasonable adjustments area, how the interview process should be done, um, how the comm should be translated differently. Um, but I think this needs to happen to influence change, not just to change the CQC, but the change the way we work, the change the way we talk, the change the way we're kind of united together. And that's the positive coming out of that. And this year coming out, we want to see a change of the way our DEN network to be reformed differently uh, because we've got the uh, area of neurodiversity is the high population in CQC and mental health group as well and long health conditions. And I want to make sure that the, the subgroup that I created a few years ago actually works, but the volume of the network is increasing. We've got over 300 members. And to hear 300 voices, and I appreciate you hearing that the CEO, 3,000 voices, I only got 300 voices, but those voices count. And we want to make sure that we hear them and feed that back and a filter system. Um, so uh, the new year, I'm talking to Mark and the OD and Jackie Jackson to see how can we structure the DEN more effectively and more responsively. So that's one of the areas we're looking at next year. The support is about how to action things and how to split areas. So we're going to try and see how we can prioritise quick wins and things that might take actions over six months, a year, two years, but these things take time. Unfortunately, some members want things to happen now, but that's not the reality. Long term, short term action. Um, we're grateful having the, the Workforce Disability Equality Standard, which really reinforce all the task projects of different elements, which are chaired by Mark Sutton. Uh, so we can take advantage of those changes. I and mean, Jackie Jackson, the interim why, why, for the new year, is looking at how the interview process is going to work and how the reasonable adjustment is going to work. and how. So the relationship with the, the exec team and the OD has been stronger this year than, than over the years. So I'm looking forward to the new year to have that stronger relationship of stronger support network. And so that's the priority is change to influence change so that's where the hope for the den would be going so uh, that's my piece i've passed you on to my colleague from the ren you're off mute see i think you can go yeah. are you ready see good afternoon afternoon Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yanai Shiripinda. I'm an adult care, social care inspector. Sorry? Yes, uh, can you hear you me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Just go ahead.
So there's a playback. Okay. Okay. Uh, And I'm a Race Equality Network co-chair with my colleague, Blazing Hell. We came into post in July 2022, hit the ground running with the successful hosting of the Black History Month. We have had several meetings with our network members, and based on the feedback, we formulated our three priorities for the coming year, 2022-2023. And these are priority number one, a targeted recruitment and promotion of the ethnic minority employees. CQC senior executive team and board must be reflective of the society and the people we serve. This includes diversity in regards to ethnicity. To progress further with the recommendations from the Roger Klein report by promoting a diverse leadership. To foster an organizational culture of inclusion that increases the recruitment and nurturing of minority ethnic colleagues into higher grades. To review recruitment and promotion policies and processes to remove bias and support colleagues from all ethnic minority backgrounds to progress in their careers. We also want to have a review of recruitment processes focus focusing more on strength than competence. An active recruitment of 820 independent panel members to the interview panels to reduce bias. Our second priority is adopting a nine box grid talent management model. This is developing a talent management approach at all levels in the CQC to identify and develop those who wish to advance in their careers. Focus on ethnic minority colleagues development by identifying and training of future leaders based on their potential and performance using the nine box grid model. Our leadership and management team to undertake a fact-based examination of the existing and potential talent of ethnic minorities. And lastly on there, we have future leaders program the mentoring and coaching schemes. Our last priority, but not the least important, is ensuring a zero tolerance to bullying, harassing, and discrimination against colleagues from an ethnic minority background. Building a more inclusive culture where everyone feels included and valued. Identifying microaggression and dealing with them, encouraging staff to report incidences of bullying and harassment, and lastly, implementing a zero tolerance approach to bullying and harassment. I will now hand over to my colleague, Emily Hempstead, for their update. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Emily Hempstead. I'm a Carers Equality Network co-chair, and that's along with Andrea and Julia. We're a recently re-elected chair team, and these are our top priorities for the network. We've already discussed these with Sean O'Kelly, who's our sponsor. So first of all are the Stay Well at Work plans, which we hope to incorporate the carer's passport. We know the plan is to roll these out in April, but we'd really like these to be brought forward as they need to be in place before we move into our new teams. And that will make sure managers are aware of any additional considerations, our personal circumstances and any informal working arrangements. We've seen there's been a Stay Well at Work plan rolled out to the operations group. And although we weren't involved in the development, it might be something different or maybe we can add to. Secondly, we'd like some support in achieving level two carers confident accreditation. That's with the employers for carers and we're already level one 
and that would make sure that we're providing practical care and support. At the moment, it's sitting with the diversity inclusion manager, Nadia Rahman. We've discussed it, but there's some work that we need to do. We need some more evidence. We also need to grow our membership. So at the moment, we've got about 140 members in our network. But we know from the staff survey, there's 49% of people said that they had caring responsibilities. So we need to do some work to promote the network to the Commission. And we want to work closely with the other networks as well to do that. And lastly, we'd like to work in collaboration with HR. That's in relation to policies and also increasing management awareness. That would be about issues affecting carers, including any emotional impact of inspections and also avenues of practical support, which links to our level two accreditation. And we'd also like managers to be aware they can use discretion when applying certain policies. And that's particularly carers leave. That would be a massively positive step for our members and make sure we get consistent care across the commission. We've also got the carers bill going through parliament at the moment. It's going to be a statutory requirement to have carers leave. And although it would be unpaid, we still need to consider how that's going to affect our policies. And that's it from us. I'm going to hand over from Diane in the Agenda Equality Network. Thanks, Emily. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so I'm Diane Horsley. I'm the co-chair of the Gender Equality Network, along with Hannah Carson. Um, we've got four key priorities and they are very much um, framed by the first one. Um, our first aim is to find another co-chair because um, um, my position in the organisation is very uncertain and so I could be out of the organisation by March. Um, if you want to talk to Hannah about her situation, you can ask her yourself. Um, she didn't want me to discuss it today, that's fine. Um, but because of that, we do need to find another co-chair and also because if we want to expand what we do, we want to make sure that we've got the extra support for that. Um, so going on to the other priorities, um, one of our key priorities is that we would like some support to develop a menopause policy within CQC. There is um, a menopause group called the Hot Topic that is sitting within wellbeing. So our aim is to do more work with those and to investigate um, menopause policies in other organisations so that we can make sure that we get the best um, fit for CQC, being as it's something that affects so many women within the organisation and it affects men as well. Um, so that brings us to another point is that we want to increase our membership, especially um, male members, because we're trying to get not just um, allyship, but we want to start promoting the idea of anti-sexism, which is very similar to the idea of anti-racism. It's not enough to say that you're not sexist. You need to actually stand up and call it out where you do see sexism happening in the organisation or anywhere. And we also want to have more men because we want to make sure that um, men feel included. And as Paul, one of our biggest champions, always says, women's issues affect men as well. And if you've got women in your family who are affected by certain things like the menopause or fertility issues and stuff like that, Men need to know about it in order to be able to help and support. And then um, another might seem low level at the moment, but it was important to us. Um, we are working towards um, having the loan working personal safety page on the internet updated because currently the wording of it is very victim blaming and it's not um, focusing on the positives and being very supportive of um, women or indeed anyone in the organisation who might find themselves um, working in either risky situations or just having to leave the office after dark and feeling um, threatened and unsafe and stuff like that. And so now I'm going to hand over to Becky Appleby-Dean. Hello, I'm Becky. I'm the chair of the LGBT Plus Network. This is my last week at CQC, so it was really nice to spend some time earlier this week with Chris Day thinking about what we've achieved as a network and what 
I hope to leave for other people to do going forward. So the first thing we want to look at is in the staff survey, people who identify themselves as lesbian and female tend to be really, really happy at CQC. They're far more happy than the kind of average colleague. And we're really interested to find out why that is, if whether it is just that we have more female colleagues at CQC, or is it particular things, particular areas are doing that we can scale? Are there particular managers doing really good work? Because I think it'd be nice to take that really positive experience and hopefully share it not just with members of the network, but the wider CQC. The next priority is to really embed a lot of LGBT plus work into the work CQC do. We know when we go out to inspect, we'll look at how LGBT plus people are treated, but sometimes that doesn't carry into CQC. So more raising awareness of colleagues' experiences mm -hmm. and how that might affect their management or kind of other things. So it's really, it's up there with when we think about disability that it, we're always looking at those impacts and we to improve. And the final one is real tangible. This year, hopefully you'll be able to put your pronouns in your display name on Teams, because we know the main way that staff meet each other most of the time now is via Teams. And we all encounter that awkwardness when you see someone's name. And Chris, our network sponsor, has encountered it before, where he'll sometimes go to events and get introduced as she rather than he. And you kind of have to make that guess. And just giving colleagues a safe way to identify themselves and to and to show any changes. So yeah, that's our update. I don't know if Nadia's joined for me to hand over to her. Nadia, I was just gonna intro you when you were being called in. Do you wanna just say, people know about your your new appointment. So if you just wanna say a quick hello and then we'll hand back to um, Ian as our chair. Well, thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for um, today. It's been really wonderful to hear the networks discuss their priorities, and it's wonderful to meet you all. I'm the new Diversity and Inclusion Manager, and I started in November. Admiral agree, Nadia. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there was, depending on how you count things, there was about 15 or 20 priorities there. We, we clearly can't uh, attempt to respond to them individually, but uh, Kate or Ian, do you want to have any um, high level of comments about the organization's um, views on a response to that? And then if there are any questions, we have time for a couple before we move on. Um, so if I just go briefly and then see if Ian wants to add anything. So um, so I am really keen that we, so there's a lot of stuff here that sits in the kind of the people space. So I'm thinking about the progress that's been made or is starting to be made around reasonable adjustments between the Disability Equality Network and people. I'm thinking about the inclusive leadership work uh, and the work that's starting around um, the Race Equality Network and the People Service. And then there's just a long to-do list there, um, uh, including the loan worker policy that, that Diane uh, brought up. I just think, um, just want to, you know, we as an exec team are really keen that we support these networks to be as um, impactful as possible. And our job is to kind of break down barriers, but also to, to get things um, motoring. So, um, so yeah, I think I think a number of us in the exec team have look, have looked to Mark, uh, who has done a great job working with Den. And I certainly know I need to step up a bit more with my gender network because I've not not been anywhere near as active as Mark has. And him and him and uh, the Den are really flying. And I know all of us on ET are kind of keen to to support in whatever way um, the networks would, would find useful as well. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kate. Uh, Ian, do you want to comment? I see Mark's come on the screen as well. So Ian first. Yeah, so I just I think just to reinforce Kate's point about how important the networks are from from my point of view, because it does it does mean that we are hearing firsthand the things that that really matter around around the uh, the different groups. I think the area that that I guess I'd be interested in hearing colleagues point of view on is this issue of intersectionality because um my my slight worry is that uh, i think every organization does this is sees sees diversity in quite narrow na narrow silos almost um and, and there's some value in doing that but there's an, there's probably an and rather than an or here that says and what happens when when people have have multiple protected characteristics and 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 does that does that matter and, and i suspect it probably does and, and and how do we as an employer um make sure we can we can blend those 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 different protected characteristics together to give people that that 
good experience because sometimes we might be we they may feel like they're well treated in in terms of one protected characteristic but you add another one and in some cases a third one on top and that becomes a very complex picture so you know as an employer we need to be in a position where we've got a an employment offer which is which which is 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 as bespoke as it can be given given the fact that there's 3,000 people but but I I'd, I'd love to just get a sense from people as to whether we need to do more in that area and and whether we can we can we can bring things together in, in a different way so uh, I'd just be interested in people's comments on that but I think just just reinforce Kate's point around how important this is and the exec sponsorship of each of the networks is is really important and very powerful and I think Mark probably wants to talk about his experience thank you Thanks. Yes, um, if that's okay, just a, just a couple of words on uh, uh, how I mean how much of a an active network uh, and 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 breadth of if you think about the breadth of issues that we've talked about uh, in the updates today, it's it's really significant and covers a, a huge ground. Uh, my personal experience is with with Paul in the disability equality network, um, and it's been a, a huge um, body of activity that we. Uh, you talked about priorities, Ian. Um, just within the, um, the disability equality network, we've got a, a body of work there, which involves nine separate work streams and a significant amount of effort around each one of those. There is there is much to do, but the, what I would take away from this is the, I think the two really important things that the networks do. One one is it, it's a supportive environment to support colleagues who, um, who may have particular challenges, um, but it's also a body of of action. And, and, a, and a real force for change. And I think in each of the, the networks, we have that um, that spirit of wanting to make uh, this, this this a better better place to work for our colleagues. And, and we will continue to do that. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Stephen Marston. Firstly, thank you all. Uh, thank you. For really, really interesting reports. But more importantly, thank you for the work you're doing to uh, make the CQC uh, an inclusive, fair and uh, great place to work. My, my question was about confidence in reporting. If if something goes wrong for a colleague, if they do experience abuse and harassment, do you do you believe members of your networks or just colleagues in general would have confidence in reporting that, whether anonymous, anonymously or not, believing that action will be taken and that they will be taken seriously, because it's something that a lot of organisations are, are wrestling with, that if you can't get colleagues to the point of being confident in being able to report, actually your understanding of what's going on in the organisation is, is compromised. So I'd be interested in, in kind of whether you think CQC has, has got to that point where there is general confidence in, in reporting cases of abuse and harassment. Paul, uh, would you be comfortable to answer that question once rather than five answers? Yeah. Yes, um, Stephen, what's been interesting, we've been working closely with um, Speak Up Guardians as well. So it's kind of working with HR to make sure that the process from if staff mention it's their line manager and then line manager to take it to HR and go on. We're trying to work on because Ian said in the uh, the network meeting last year and he wants to make sure the line managers and the staff work together closely because that's the, the like a pastoral care in there. They know each other and they work together and then we we'll work closely with Freedom Speak Up. So it's giving them more of a pathway and at the same time is making sure that the response back from that pathway is clear as well, because what sometimes did happen, that the pathway goes up and it passed on, passed on, and then it kind of diluted somewhere. So that's coming the the process. I think the reasonable adjustment area where people made that complaint, the feedback of that, and hopefully that pattern working with Jackie Jackson will hopefully continue with that. So, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Ziani, do you want to add something? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to mention that as the Race Equality Network, we've had the opportunity of pulling in our members together when we have had significant events happening like the George Floyd, and we have made our submissions just like after the Kumar case to say this is how our members feel, and our submissions have actually been received, and we feel that they are being considered. 
and the actions plan that have been coming on board now, we feel that our voices are being heard. So we think that opportunity is there in that we see that our rent sponsor, Tyson, is actually engaging and taking on board what we have to say. So we are having vibrant discussions, considerations of different uh, thoughts within our membership. So I think this relationship will continue to build and for us to be heard. Thank you. Uh, Jora, you had your hand up. Perhaps one last comment on this. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, thank you all for, for sharing the initiatives. I think they're all fantastic. I actually learned a lot um, just listening uh, to, 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 I was putting it back in my own life. Um, but um, how do we measure progress? So we talked about where we want to go. How do we know where we've been and, and, and where we've reached so far? I mean, the, the Equality Network, you know, has been running for a few years now. Is it where we want it to be right now? And are we moving to the sort of next tier? Or are we quite, you know, we'll never get to the end probably, um, um, hopefully one day, but uh, we'll see. Um, but how do we measure um, the effectiveness over the past three years, say? Paul, there are a lot of hands up, but I, as the network chair, I just wonder whether you want to have a first attempt at answering that, and then uh, if any colleague wants to add, we can do that as well. Yeah, what's really uh, impacted this year, how the voice network working together closely, and the whole point of working together closely, that we share the impact, and also share the workload where uh, the Wren's doing something, we, we will work with them and let them lead it. And the Den's doing it, they let the Den lead it. And on Monday, just gone, we had a um, our first effective training where we joined in with our sponsors, talking about priorities and plans for the year. So the networking between the, the Equality Network Group and the exec team are stronger, stronger link as ever before. So it's taken those years to get there. And it's now maintaining that. So we're having some CPD. We, we had a couple of hours learning about communication. How can we communicate effectively with our peers? And how can we help cope with their impact if they come up with some uh, grievance to say, well, you haven't helped me as a chair. And how can we cope with that? So it's, 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 it kind of gives us some toolkits. How can support and also filter to the exec team as well? Because over the years, I could hand up being a, a chair for a while. We have been acting as a buffer we've been taking the blow and there's nobody behind just hold our backs for well, this year i'm sensing that i've got the exec behind me as well as mark going paul it's not your role to take out let me take that let me investigate it and come back to you and that and that's the support we want as a chair and we're getting that so i'm looking forward to the new year where we're going to invest more time in that okay thanks paul so Ali, your hand is up. Is that from previously or did you want to add to what Paul said? OK. Um, Ian, uh, Trenum, do you want to so, find I a think comment? Just, just, uh, just to reinforce what Paul's just said, I, th I think my, my sort of measure of success is to, for Paul to say that sort of thing, uh, that, that he is getting the support that he needs. It feels like it's mm -hmm. an ongoing dialogue rather than, a, if you like, a, a measure that, uh, uh, in terms of a single thing uh, that, we're, that we're aiming for. I, I think the other thing I wanted to come in on was just this, this point around, uh, the, the question you asked Ian around, do you feel like you can speak up and, and do you feel um, that, that action is being taken? And, and I think it's a really tough one to demonstrate because I can think of a number of cases where, where action has been taken, but that action has been by definition confidential because it's it, it relates to uh to, to it to to individuals and, and action has been quietly taken from from issues that have been raised um but the issue is is you, you can't really advertise that and and so um that's an important point in terms of giving people confidence to raise issues i, I want people to have that confidence but i i'm in this slightly perverse position i can't feed back to to what's been said when when issues have been raised so um that the, the networks have an important sort of intermediary role that paul was just sort of describing a little bit there uh in in, in carrying that message that that actually you know we are very serious about taking action if there's if there if there are if, if there is if there are problems but, but playing that back to the organisation is quite difficult. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I mean, I, I was 
probably you've all answered my main question before I could answer, but, but it's just about the, the connectivity between the networks. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it seems to me that, I mean, we are a product of the society we live in. Uh, we've got three and a half thousand people recruit from many jurisdictions. So if, if you look at the points that are being raised, the priorities, which actually cover a huge spread from what seemed the way that it was supposed to be simple to fix and quick wins to much more deep rooted cultural things. Um, but, but, but it seems to me there's almost two parts to this. One is there are certain things that uh, uh, are, are required action that reflect the needs of the individual. But actually, if you've got an organization that is uh, inclusive and suitably flexible in, in its natural culture, then many of the other things would get fixed, irrespective of which um, a, a protected area or, or network you're a member of, because you, you just have a more inclusive uh, organization. And it, it seems to me I am hearing from the executive team that that's where they want to go. Um, I'm not sure I'm looking for a response to that unless you disagree, but th thanks very much. Uh, look, Paul and colleagues, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. I hope that the fact that um, the board um, is interested in uh, hearing what you have to say firsthand and the excellent question about how do we actually measure whether it's making a difference uh, shows you how important the board. I mean, Ian's already made his comments about the importance of the executive, and I would echo that from the, the board's point of view as well. So um, many of you may not be used to speaking in public in this sort of nature. So I particularly thank you for, for that and joining us. Um, if we could um, move on to um, the, the next item, we're slightly behind schedule, but I hope Jane won't mind. Um, have we got Jane joining us now? You have indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's uh, great to be back here. And I can't believe it's a whole year since I actually started. And I came to my first board not long after I started. And obviously, I came in the summer. And where has the year gone? It has been, um, as I was reflecting and preparing the board paper, um, a, a lot of water under the bridge, um, some of which has been really positive, And some, if you look at some of the high profile reports and incidents, such as Ockenden, such as Bill Kirkup's report into Shrewsbury, um, sorry, into East Kent's maternity service, such as the Panorama programme, there continue to be high profile cases where workers speak up and the right thing doesn't happen or where workers don't speak up because they don't feel psychologically safe enough to do so with sometimes drastic consequences. So I think my message to you as a board today is that the work remains as important as ever, and we know why, because we see the consequences where um, where things can go horribly wrong if people don't feel empowered and safe to speak up. But also there is good progress as well. So it's a mixed picture. There are some organisations that are making great strides in improving their speaking up culture and psychological safety. Um, but our guardians continue to tell us that not all workers feel safe to speak up and uh, across England. And, um, and that's backed up by, by some of those high profile reports I've talked about. So it remains really, really important that we stay working in this space. And I say we as ourselves as National Guardian's office, myself as the National Guardian, but yourselves as CQC and the board and leadership of CQC, because you have a key role alongside us in terms of the regulation of what the providers are doing and that important part of the well-led inspection in terms of speak up culture in its widest sense, not just a freedom to speak up guarding route, is absolutely key. So I just wanted to um, to, to start, but, but that's my preface. You will have read my paper. I don't intend to go through it in terms of line by line. I would just like to highlight a couple of things to you. The first is laying our annual report before Parliament. I'd obviously hoped that our annual report from the office would have come to you as a board long before now. It was ready in July, but due to um, the ministerial changes when um, Boris Johnson resigned and then the Queen's death, it was impossible to get another grid slot. But I have heard um, today from Department of Health and Social Care that it's looking very likely for early January, and I'll keep you um, updated on that. Um, I think it's really important that we land that report because then coming hot on its tails later in January will be the first of our speak up reviews, which is into the 10 ambulance trusts across the country. And that's going to be a really important review of the speak up culture across ambulance trusts 
speaking in a thematic way. Um, there are many reviews going on in the ambulance sector at the moment because of the challenges of culture and uh, and performance. Uh, obviously, ours is into is into culture, but it's uh, it's really important that that lands well. And I think having the opportunity to talk about freedom to speak up more generally before that will be will be helpful timing, um, at least coming on the back of the delays that we've had. I also just wanted to flag to you that um, in terms of our governance, um, I went two weeks ago um, under Sally Cheshire's um, leadership to ACGC to present um, annually regarding our governance and risk registers and had a really constructive meeting and hopefully board members who were present at that will feel um, uh, assured around our approach to governance uh, and, uh, and, and Ian as accounting officer will take that. One of our biggest risks, which I'll just mention very, um, uh, very briefly here, uh, is our funding ongoing. Our MOU comes to an end at the end of March, and uh, there's, uh, there's there's negotiations happening with NHS England as the co-funder with yourselves to sort out a funding agreement um, from March. So at the moment, that's a risk for me because I have a, a, a you know a well-developed business plan, but I'm currently without the, the funding agreement in place. But we're working with Department of Health and, and very much CQC colleagues are, are helping me with that, Chris Usher um, and team in particular. So thank you, Chris. Um, I put in our activity just sort of some reflections on key areas. Of course, it doesn't cover the whole areas of our work. Um, I've mentioned ambulance trusts, but I do just want to mention the, the work of um, our team, but actually of the guardians in Speak Up Month. So you all will be aware that longstanding, there's been a month of raising awareness around the importance of speaking up. And um, there's some highlights in the report here today, and I just wanted to call out to our comms team supporting the much wider work that goes on across the whole of the NHS in England relating to um, raising awareness of speaking up. I also wanted to speak to a point that's not in um, my paper, but I know from conversation that I've had with, um, with yourself, Ian, as chair recently, that one of the things that we're very aware of in the National Guardian's office, and uh, we've done research on it and actually listening to previous speakers, it's really important, is the barriers to work workers speaking up and one of those barriers absolutely um, is can be a cultural barrier and uh, with the growing number of absolutely vital internationally educated workforce that we have in England um, there can be barriers for that workforce speaking up because of not understanding the culture of speaking up here and it's something that our research we did research with Roger Klein into minority ethnic workers experience of speaking up back during the pandemic there's been much wider work that has gone on to reinforce the fact that there are many barriers to people speaking up including hierarchy gender um, contractual status as I say, minority ethnic background, but we're very cognizant of the of that sort of softer stuff in terms of maybe that you come from a different culture and it's not respectful to even speak to someone who's older than you, let alone more senior than you. And yet our expectations, particularly, for example, for those of us who are on professional registers, there is an expectation that is the right thing to do. It's part of my code of conduct as a nurse to speak up. Um, but that can be different if you um, are, are educated elsewhere or brought up elsewhere. So it's an important part of work for my team. It's included in our training. It's something that we very much um, support guardians to be thinking about in their own workplaces. And it's something that I'm working at a national level with the team, with um, the chief nursing officers, um, advisor on internationally educated workforce, the NNC on uh, in, on international recruits into nursing to look at how we can help that understanding of what the culture of speak up actually is here. So we're very cognizant of it. And it is an important issue, not just obviously within nursing, but across all professions and non-professions to make sure we get right to reduce the barriers so that everybody feels safe to speak up, whatever their background, whatever barriers um, they may feel they, 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 they have in speaking up. So I'm just going to conclude, um, if I may, Chair, just by drawing attention to the forward plan, the forward look. Um, I'm not bringing you the business plan here today, but concluding um, with some next steps in terms of particular areas of work that will be a priority for us. But that's not set in stone, depending on what the national picture is looking like. And we continue to, uh, to do that work, both within organisations with guardians at a national level um, and carrying out the reviews we're doing. So thank you for your support. Happy to take any questions on any of the detail in the paper. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Well, you've already answered the question that uh, I had, so you preempted that. So thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Mark Chambers. 
Thanks very much. And, and thanks, Jane. That was enormously helpful. Just just sort of one question on detail in, in the report. You, you know, you, you're, you're sort of tracking a, 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 an uptick in, uh, re, in in the number of cases, the proportion of cases that relate to bad behaviour. You're also tracking an uptick in proportion of cases where there's some evidence of, 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 of detriment. Um, the detriment level seems still well below the actual experience levels of, 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 of detriment that we, you know, we see from, from other sur surveys, which suggest, at least in a corporate world, it's sometime, sometimes around you know, 40 percent uh, of people who speak up actually suffer some detriment for doing it, which is a, a shocker, but it's reality. Um, do you think this reflects people just being more comfortable and more aware and more willing to come forward, or or, or are we seeing, um, you know, are we are, are we seeing a worse environment for for people speaking up, or do we just not know? Thanks, Mark. I think I think we don't know. Um, obviously, trends are what are important. Well, individual cases are what are important. Nobody should suffer detriment for uh, for doing the right thing and and speaking up in their work environment in a constructive um, in a constructive way. However, we do see that the the detriment figures that we reported during the um, during the previous year. Um, that's the first time they've sort of gone back down. Um, uh, and what's really important is that we don't continue to see that trend. Yes, it may be smaller than what we see elsewhere, but, but for me, any detriment is wrong. And obviously there are very high profile cases of detriment um, that we see that, because actually this is the reports of what's coming through the Guardian route and the Guardian is the additional valuable route, not people who are reporting um, and speaking up through HR, line management, patient safety, etc. What I don't know is those levels of detriment there. Uh, what strikes me is that still not enough is being done and not all leadership teams across organisations across the NHS are taking this as, um, as, as, as a matter to really look into, to track, monitor. Because if people are fearing that bad things will happen, we know what happens then. People don't speak up and then we have the terrible fa care failings that we've had in the past. So it's one to watch. And when I go on my visits to trusts, when I speak with leadership teams or do board development, I am always asking, what are you doing to uh, to address that, to build the confidence and the trust in your organisation that people can speak up in safety and won't suffer consequences, you know, negative consequences for doing so. So I think it's a great question, Mark. I don't have the answers yet, but it's one I will continue to raise the profile of and watch the data and work with others on. And I really hope that through the inspection and the regulatory framework that CQC will be very much looking at that as well in terms of part of that well-led, you know, so tell us about how you do manage that, give us examples of and, and that our inspectors will really get under the skin of those wider implications of the speak up culture, including any perceptions of detriment or actual detriment that workers have. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I mean, as, as you know, Jen, over the next few months, we're uh, upgrading uh, our, our methodology to produce the single assessment framework to look at things both at a at an integrated care system level, but also at an individual provider level. I, I'm really interested in the point you were making about the the speak up dimension to uh, overseas workers uh, and the work you're doing with with other colleagues. So I think in, in due course, it would be really interesting to to understand uh, at a working level. Um, what, what insights that you and colleagues are coming coming forward with, with a view to us trying to embed that in our single assessment framework, uh, so we can start to look at that in, in more detail. Because I, I am conscious that there's a there's an understandable uh, large increase in the number of overseas workers in in the NHS at the moment, and and, and there's a lot of real real positives to that. But I want to make sure that 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 the um, the, the, the welcome that they get and the, the their ability to speak up is also as good as it possibly can can be and we, we play our part as a regulator in in uh, in promoting that thank you yeah yeah thanks very much i mean it, it's interesting there's variations on this theme that come up in about four recent meetings i've had outside the organization one of which i hope you were at as well so don't see any more questions so jane um Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Comprehensive uh, report as usual. We wish you luck in the next. We look forward to the report. We wish you luck in the next few months uh, dealing with funding. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much. And I look forward to coming back in due course. Thank you, colleagues. Okay. Um, right. Uh, we have uh, a few matters now for board approval. Some are more straightforward than others, probably. 
Um, the first is the uh, proposed modern slavery statement. So, Kate, I think uh, you were going to pick this up initially, but then involve uh, one or two of your colleagues. But let me hand straight to you. Fabulous. Thank you. So uh, we're here today to seek your approval for a revised, refreshed um, statement on modern slavery. Our last one was published in 2018. We needed to, to relook at it and make sure it reflected our, our current position. So without further ado, uh, Debbie, who's the director for people with learning disabilities and autism and autistic people, is also responsible for safeguarding where this work falls. And uh, uh, Hayley's our deputy director leading the work. And Lucy is our head of um, equality uh, and human rights issues. So the, that's the team but I'll hand over to Debbie to um, uh, flag key issues in the paper. Over to you, Debbie. Thank you. I just really wanted to say this is a really increasingly important topic. And as an organisation, we need to be confident in our approach internally. But we also need to consider whether uh, we should have a greater role in drawing attention to the issues about modern slavery as it affects regulated services. So I'm simply going to hand over to Lucy, who's going to briefly talk about the paper, and then Hayley, who's going to say a couple of lines about our intentions to scope out what further work we should consider. Thank you, Debbie. And yes, there are, there are kind of two aspects to this. The first is um, we don't legally have to produce a modern slavery statement, unlike some organisations, but we do it because it's actually helpful to us and because it aligns with our values. Um, so the two aspects is the internal aspect, which is like um, around, for example, HR and recruitment and procurement and what we do as a big organisation, which we have um, good processes for in terms of in terms of preventing modern slavery. And then there's the regulatory aspect, but there's, which is kind of in, in two parts. The first is that we've um, we've got a contract with the Home Office to to inspect safe houses for um, for survivors of modern slavery, which we've had since 2021, which is up and running. And we're about to produce our first annual report about that. And the second is the more complex issue, maybe because it cuts across our regulatory work, which is what do we do if we um, suspect modern slavery um, is occurring in, in all sorts of services that we regulate, for example, in adult social care services. So that's the kind of overall scope. We're building on our 2018 report, um, updating it and, and, um, and adding more in about the safe houses, but also going forward, as Debbie says, there's quite a lot to do around the safeguarding aspects, which I'll hand over to Hayley to talk about. Thank you both. And um, really just to, to echo what um, Debbie and Lucy has, has said about this being a really critical area for us as, a, as the regulator. Um, and we can use this statement as a springboard to, to refresh and, and rescope out um, what it is that we can do to continue to improve. We are actually seeing quite a sharp rise in modern slavery activity within health and social care at the moment, which I would say is making it really you know, quite a, a hot topic. And this relates both to services regulated by us as the regulator, but also those that are falling out of scope, such as recruitment agencies and nursing agencies as well. And we are in contact now with a number of external partners, including the Department of Health and Social Care, who are also reporting um, this growing trend. So for us, um, we're going to be focusing on, you know, what we need to offer our staff in terms of tools and guidance and training to make sure that they know the early warning signs and they know exactly what to do and how we refer through the national referral mechanism. Um, if we do suspect um, signs of modern slavery, but also actually looking externally um, to, to this as a live issue, because as I mentioned, recruitment agencies with the high gaps in staffing across the sector, um, we're increasingly seeing that as a potential gap um, where people are being exploited and providers needing to have really good due diligence about the checks that they do as well when they're using recruitment agencies. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, the I'll just go straight to questions if that's okay, Stephen. Uh, quick question, if I could. Um, just interested in sort of how you're seeing the scope of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to influence, because clearly you, you've covered the chunks of well, we're we've got CQC itself in scope. <clears throat> we also have people who are working in health and care settings in scope. But many health settings, particularly GP surgeries, others, may themselves be seeing service users, patients, 
who actually they begin to suspect there's something wrong here. Uh, I, I, you know, I think this person may be the victim of modern slavery. Does the scope of what you're trying to do reach all the way there or, or not? Actually, um, it does, and it's already covered um, when we inspect. So, for example, when we inspect GP practices, we would expect them to be meeting Regulation 13 around safeguarding, which would mean that actually, um, you know, they should be able to explain how they're supporting their staff to be trained in seeing the warning signs, because often GPs, for example, are going to be one of the first points of call who could recognise this. And we have already seen a couple of examples of, of less than ideal practice um, coming through um, in terms of a lack of awareness um, when GPs have, you know, come across people who are showing indications of potentially having been trafficked or being exploited. So, again, um, I think that goes down to um, making sure our inspectors are very clear about what they should be looking for on inspection, but also asking some of those wider questions about actually, you know, are providers well trained and do they know, you know, what they should be doing as well? Ian, you wanted to comment? Just, uh, I think it was just to build on, on Hayley's answer. I think, I think just to be clear, this statement does not apply to GPs directly, but it's about our assessment of, of their modern slavery position uh, is, is what we look at, if that, makes, if that makes sense, which I think is the subtlety of your question, Stephen. So just to so I'm clear, to what extent does this represent a... Uh, uh, an updating of a policy to reflect what we're doing, or to what extent is this a statement of intent about things we're going to do differently? In in many ways, Ian, um, the statement is quite similar to what we've had previously, um, with some clarifications, including the inclusion of safe houses in that programme of work. So it's nothing that, that's particularly different or new for us. But it, as I said, it does give us an opportunity for us to revisit you know, our approach and our awareness, both um, internally and externally. But there isn't anything, you know, that's um, of, of any massive difference to what we've had before. Okay. Well, we had a conversation, didn't we, at Regulatory Leadership Board earlier in the week about this being a, a developing area that we want to have really good visibility of in terms of our data, in terms of us having a really good insight into the prevalence and, and issues. So, so Debbie, Haley, Lucy, there'll be a team of people drawing up a, a piece of work that we will potentially look to start in spring um, so that we can make sure we're, we're bringing as much information and insight to this topic as possible as well. OK. Lucy, you want to comment? Uh, yes, just, just to really restate what Kate's just said, I'm also going to be bringing the equality objectives deliverables to the board in February. And one of the uh, one of the things that we're considering in the lead up to that, this is a bit of a trail, is what we might do more generally about um, internationally recruited workers in relation to our work on workforce equality, because there is obviously a lot of uh, pressure to recruit uh, internationally at the moment. But there are um, there are. Uh, where this is where this is not done well or where where services are under a lot of pressure it, it can lead into situations which um are akin to to modern slavery so um so we are we are doing some proposals around that we're also talking with the dhsc and the nhs england about about um uh, workforce equality particularly for internationally recruited low paid staff on the back of a report that the equality and human rights commission did um about low paid staff uh, low paid ethnic minority staff working in health and social care so there are a number of bits of work that we will join together in a, in a program around around the particular issues um, about staff and potential modern slavery issues. Okay, thanks. So the, the, the request is to approve a modern slavery statement, which is not a huge amount different to what we had before. It's just updated. I think most of the discussion has been not around the statement itself, but what sits around it and what are we doing. So um, if, if I could try to separate those out, I mean, if, if Haley is saying that uh, that this is suddenly becoming a much bigger issue for us. So I think there's probably something that, whether it's at the ARAC or somewhere else, or perhaps the executive, first of all, just make sure we understand what the risks are to what we do. We don't want scope group. We can't, you know, we're not here to police uh, uh, the whole system. But um, I think it'd be useful if it's on the uptake just to make sure we've understood what the risks are to us and our reputation. Uh, but as far as the policy itself is concerned, or the statement rather, it's not a policy, 
are we happy to approve it? Ian, I see you've got a hand up. I'll come to you in a moment. It, but it, it can, can just I just a, see whether we're happy to approve it? Uh, yeah, hands going up. No one's saying no. Sorry, Ian. Just it was just that first action you were talking about. I think it's, it's, it's something which is definitely on our agenda as an exec team. So I, at, a, at an appropriate point, if this does, when the, when the, when the evidence suggests that this is something to, to really worry about, then we, we would, of course, bring it here and we would we would talk about what we do about it publicly. But I don't think at this stage it needs a sort of come back in three months type type action. I think yeah. I think I'd, can I ask you just to remit it to us that we will escalate it at, at, a, at an appropriate point in due course. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. OK, um, Debbie, Haley, Lucy, thank you very much indeed. I think that's approved. Um, we're going to run probably very slightly over. We always would have done because we had some questions, which I'll have to do with after five, but we're, we're very close. I hope no one has to, to dash. Um, the minutes of the previous meeting, they were circulated in advance. Um, I didn't have any comments. Are people happy to approve them? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, there is, um, so I'll just get my, uh, there are some actions from previous meetings. Probably what's required, stated here just needs a bit of update. So the first uh, item one on here, um, the, um, I'm not sure we've been able to get all the data for inclusion of the report. So um, maybe we leave that open if that's okay. Um, and then on the second one, Chris, um, it's down for suggested for closure. Do you have any comments, Chris Usher? Yeah, I think it's probably prematurely closed. I refer to this when I give the update in terms of funding split, but we'll make sure that's incorporated in the report for next time. OK, C can we amend then that rather than call them closed, both open, but we'll uh, deal with them uh, at future meetings. Um, the... Um, <clears throat> Sally, um, could you give us a brief all report on your final chairmanship of ARAC meetings? Yeah, thank you, Ian. In the interest of time, I'll be very brief because there's a report that went to our private board with the detail in it. So the headlines are that our financial statement audit is complete, barring um, something out of our control, which is about assurance around local government pension schemes, which is a problem for many um, public bodies. So CQC have done what they need to and I would like to thank um, the team from Ian downwards um, for a successful audit and hopefully laying of our accounts in due course. We continue to pursue a full programme of risk and internal audit um, which is progressing well. These things are always backloaded but um, we've taken into account all the key risks I think um, that CQC has, and we've also welcomed Health Watch and National Guardian's Office to our meetings. So that programme continues. Um, I'm most proud of the fact that, as evidenced in the board papers today, we now have a framework which looks at our strategy, um, key performance measures, our business plan delivery, our risk framework, and it feels like it's joined up. And that's been quite a, um, a piece of work over the last two years, but hopefully a very positive direction and I'd just like to say that the exec commitment to this audit committee um, far outweighs um, many others that I've seen and I think Ian and now Kate and Chris and everybody who comes along plus my non-exec colleagues who've been I think Jane used the phrase before supportive but appropriately challenging um, is a good mix um, so I'm I'm signing off I'd just like to say thanks to everybody. OK, um, thanks very much, Sally. Um, uh, Mark, do you want to give a brief oral update on uh, the recent RGC meeting? Very happy to. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've had our first meeting of the uh, relaunched and reconstituted um, RGC following the approval of the terms of reference at the last board. Uh, welcome, Stephen and Belinda, to the to the committee, the focus of our committee work is, you know, at a very high level is going to be, you know, how the design of our regulatory model, um, it, you know, fits to our uh, regulatory responsibilities uh, and looking at the effectiveness, at, 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 the, at its effectiveness in implementation. So, um, you know, part of that is going to be um, keeping an eye on, the, our, you know, the outputs of our proactive improvement uh, program. 
uh, how we're responding to external developments, how we're responding to changes in the external environment, uh, reviewing our own measures of effectiveness, uh, our KPIs in relation to the, the, the model, uh, and, and insights from key stakeholders uh, as to as to how we're doing. Um, the, the, the first meeting, we spent time reviewing our current design and, and how it maps to our regulatory responsibilities and then discussing the the, the, the shape of what we hope is going to be the standing um, re report uh, for future meetings. But even even those discussions actually surfaced a potentially pretty heavy agenda for us in terms of areas that we will want to explore in the future. So the, the meetings going forward are going to be, um, you know, with using that core paper as, a, as, as, the, as the framing first hour of the meeting. Uh, and then deep dives into into the, a number of areas, and we've already discussed how we can prioritise those and make sure that they're coordinated with the board activities. We will look at the risk register at the end of the uh, at the end of each meeting. That's not to um, uh, undermine uh, the audit and risk committee's. Um, uh, holistic view of, of risk, but it's to make sure that we can feed back uh, uh, not just to the to, to the board in terms of, you know, our assurance conclusions, but feedback to ARAC uh, on any views on um, significant risks that we have seen during the meeting or our views mm -hmm. on the effectiveness of, of internal controls that relate to uh, risks on the risk register. So that's where we are. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I mean, two important updates there, um, particularly for, I guess, for RGs, uh, the, the RCG, given the fact we haven't, been, haven't met for a little while. Uh, do any of my colleagues have questions for either Sally or Mark? No? OK, well, thank you very much, both of you. I think that does bring us to the end of the formal agenda. Um, before I move to questions from the public, first I can ask colleagues if any other business. I haven't been notified of anything. No. Um, so can I just deal with a, a couple of things? I would just want to comment on two people. I'm going to take this in alphabetical order. That's, so don't, that's the only thing you can read into it. Um, and I, I suppose I should make it. I'm using surnames because I'd have come up with a different result if I'd used uh, first names. But anyway, um, Cheshire, um, you're close. Sally, you're close to the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, I did mention it earlier. You've already talked about uh, leaving. I'd just like to uh, give my thanks on behalf of the board. And obviously, I've known you less time than the other member of the board, since I'm still the newest member. Um, but I would like to thank you on behalf of, of all colleagues. But also, personally, um, uh, we, we have made quite a lot of change over the last little while, um, including, for example, uh, the, the joined up thinking you've talked about and the bigger focus on risk in the renamed audit and risk assurance committee. Uh, but I think uh, you've done a great job there and uh, been a great support to me as I have settled in. Um, I personally don't need to say a lot more because you are, of course, going on to chair NHS resolution, a fellow body. So I'm sure that Ian, quite apart from any other contacts, I'll be seeing you uh, in, in other fora in relation to that role. But can I thank you very much indeed for this? And can I wish you um, every good luck as chair of NH resolution? both um, for your career as a chair, but also for the good of the organisation, which obviously I have uh, a long affinity with. So thank you very much indeed, Sally. Um, and then the other, if, if only we were meeting physically, we could do this in a much better way. Um, but uh, the other is uh, Rebecca. Um, so you come second on the basis Lloyd is after Cheshire, Rebecca. Um, uh, Ian's already commented um, but uh, from your uh, input as a member of the executive team, uh, but my colleagues tell me that you did your best to keep them completely honest over the last few years as the, the legal counsel to the board. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for that. And again, at, at a personal level, um, you've been very patient in explaining the regulations to me, which stand about eight feet high, and then re-explaining them to me when I've forgotten them the first time around. Uh, the, the, the complexity of the regulations surrounding what we do is, is quite astounding. Um, so I appreciate that personally. So um, you are, I believe, retiring or something close to it. So we wish you and your partner um, good fortune in doing that uh, and a good break. 
And of course, if, if you get bored in the beginning of January, you'd like to come back, well, the door's always open. But thank you very much indeed to both of you. I just wish we could have a, a better round of claps, but I see a few going up on the screen. Um, the, and the train strike did, of course, mean we couldn't meet up with you yesterday as well, for which um, uh, uh, the RMT can apologise if they wish. Um, we did have three questions from the public, um, um, from, from Mr Pike. And Sean, there are two for you and Kate, one for you. Um, I'll take them individually if I could. So, Sean, let's begin. Uh, what changes does CQC intend to make to improve its regulation of secure psychiatric hospitals? Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, there are a number of ways in which we plan to improve our approach to inspecting psychiatric hospitals. Firstly, we'll be undertaking a greater number of unannounced inspections in locations and services that we consider to be at a greater risk of developing closed cultures, such as forensic services, learning disability services, and psychiatric intensive care units. We will also be increasing the number of out of hours inspections to gain a broader view of how these units function uh, irrespective of time of day. Uh, we will be increasing the numbers of experts by experience joining our inspections, uh, experts who can help us gain an authentic appreciation of what life is like, what life is really like for users of services in specific locations. And we are also developing an observational methodology for inspections so that inspectors can spend more time seeing how staff interact with patients and how staff respond to and support patients when, for example, they are in distress. Uh, currently, a significant focus of our inspections is on reviewing records and interviewing patients and staff. And while this is important, of course, observing how staff and patients relate to each other in a therapeutic way, in a therapeutic environment, should be a significant addition to our assessment approach. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. It's probably worth just adding as well that, that obviously our regulations uh, both give us powers on the one hand and put limits around what we can do on the other. So I think your, your answer was given in the context of within the existing regulations, what can we do? Um, also, we need to look separately at whether or not if there were changes in regulations or the things we could do differently. But um, uh, I think you thank you for that answer. And then. Um, the second question for you is, how does CQC regulate NHS dental practices to ensure they comply with the NHS constitution and in particular with patient choice? Yes, um, well, CQC regulates dental practices through uh, inspection and assessment of their safety and effectiveness. And the NHS constitution does not mention dental services specifically. Uh, and as dental practices are independent contractors, they can choose how much NHS work they undertake. Uh, this can unfortunately have a limiting effect on the patient choice and the availability of NHS dentistry. But the CQC's role is to ensure that when where dental services are provided, they meet the required quality and safety standards. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Sean. And then, Kate, finally for you, um, how is CQC planning to assess the performance of integrated care boards? Um, uh, thank you. I, I, probably not the three day answer, Kate. Yeah, no, I can do I can do. So um, as colleagues will be aware, we've developed a new single assessment framework, which is our new methodology for assessing uh, providers, local authorities and integrated care systems. The Secretary of State sets our priorities for integrated care systems, which is leadership, integration, quality and safety. And currently our proposal about that methodology and approach is with the Secretary of State for approval. Once we've got that, we'll be sharing that more widely through the springtime. OK, thanks very much, Kate. So I think that so uh, having dealt with the formula business, that's dealt with the questions. So sorry, it's a few minutes over, but it was a tight agenda. Uh, so for all of those of you listening, thank you very much indeed for being with us for the last several hours. Uh, to my colleagues on the board and others on the executive team, and to Paul Kirby uh, with the, uh, the networks, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again on the 1st of February. Thank you. Thanks.